uh, get you on that list. And then when we get to the break, I'll le read off where we are on the list and, and we'll hopefully be efficient in that, in that process. Next slide, please. Um, so here's the agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to have a few opening comments. Um, uh, we're going to have some community updates. Uh, then we're going to have a, an update on the decommissioning process from Doug Bowder. We're going to talk about where we are with environmental stewardship, uh, in particular on two topics. Uh, one around uh, the radiation monitoring system that many members of the community have been very keen to be put into place. Uh, there'll be an update on that. And then also liquid waste discharges um, from the plant operations, in particular the spent fuel pools. Then we're going to have an update on fuel transfer operations, um, uh, the schedule, where we are uh, with that, a break, then uh, public comments and, and a public dialogue, a facilitated dialogue after that, um, and then some closing, uh, some, some closing comments. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I want to make just a few um, uh, opening uh, comments. Uh, and then turn it over to Doug to talk about this uh, the, the situation. Uh, in particular, obviously, we're going to be talking talking about uh, COVID-19 questions uh, tonight. So next slide, please. So uh, obviously, we're doing this as a virtual meeting in the interest of public health. Um, and uh, members of the CEP will be able to ask questions during the first part of the meeting, just as is normal. So your microphones are open. If you want to jump in, please say your name, and then I will, um, uh, if we could put that slide back up, it would be great. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll um, uh, give you the floor, and then people can make your comments. Please be sure to say who you are, um, because uh, even more than when we have uh, video form. We have a, a in-person format. It's very hard to know who's, who's speaking uh, and, and when. For the pro public comment period, we're going to open mics one at a time. If you're on the list, do the normal three minutes. Uh, I'll say a little more about that when we get uh, to that to that stage. Um, I'd also just welcome. It's not on the list here, but I really would welcome feedback from people after this meeting about what's working, what's not working uh, with these uh, hosted virtual meetings. Um, we're going to have to figure this technology out. Everybody's trying to figure this technology out, and it seems quite plausible, if not likely, that we're going to have another meeting in the same format. Um, so we need to, to – this is not a one-off. We need to do better and uh, learn quickly, and uh, I welcome your input on that. We give the floor now to Doug Bowder, who's going to talk about where the site is with regard to the pandemic protocol. Um, and the orders in place uh, for the federal government, in particular the state of California. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. I appreciate the intro there. And um, I just want to point out that um, uh, thank everybody for joining, uh, all, all of you online. And um, I point out that we do have the songs pandemic protocol in place here at the station. Actually, I'm presenting from my office here at the station and the other presenters are in different conference rooms and offices, so we're actually split up here, um, which could create some coordination in answering questions. But if a panel member has a question, please stop me or one of the presenters, and we'll do our absolute best to, to go after the proper response. Um, so our pandemic protocol is in place at the station. I, I, I want everybody to know that this is not uncommon for nuclear plants. Um, it's actually um, it's something that the NRC expects us to do. Um, our protocol is built in stages, and we um, think that our response is appropriate for the condition that we're in now. I also want to emphasize, and I'm, I'm probably going to say this more than once tonight, that protection of our employees at the plant, especially our uh, employees who do essential operations, critical operations for the station, that involve protecting the fuel security officers, operators, is paramount, and our protocol is built to support that. Um, it is compliant with the governor's stay-at-home stay order, which was issued on the 19th of March. Along with that order, um, we reviewed um, some Department of Homeland Security guidance in the form of a memo that was associated with a critical infrastructure. And since that time, I think some of you know that the governor provided additional guidance for essential workers um, last weekend following the issuance of the order, which we can talk a little more about um, this evening. But the, the pandemic protocol in place at Songs, as well as the order, ensures worker safety, 
and for us as well, regulatory compliance and uh, continuity of our business. We do have strict travel restrictions in place as part of our pandemic protocol. And in general, when somebody travels, even domestically, they undergo a review process if they traveled outside the local area. And that typically involves a quarantine for 14 days before they're um, allowed to return to work here at Songs. Uh, next slide, please, Manuel. So I want to point out just a couple of points regarding our, our protocol and, and the COVID-19 response here at Songs. Our contractors are committed to it. Um, they're dedicated to it. They're just as concerned with their worker safety uh, and in some cases continuity of operations as we are. Um, following the issuance of the governor's safer at home order on, the, on March the 19th, uh, we curtailed work. Um, we took a pause on fuel transfer we curtailed all of the uh, deconstruction activities we had going on. And of course, we, played, we placed uh, our workplaces in a safe condition. And, um, and we took a review on location of activities and interaction with critical staff. We reviewed the, the, the governor's order. We looked at the Department of Homeland Security uh, guidance associated with, um, the, issued on the same day as the order. And we also reviewed the essential workers um, a guidance provided by the governor, like I said, last weekend. Um, we sent a, a note out to uh, uh, stakeholders this week. Uh, we did resume um, uh, fuel transfer operations yesterday. We're doing those safely. We're doing those compliantly. And, um, and we, you know, we, we feel that uh, as, as other utilities are approaching the same situation as we're in, um, uh, the, the work that we're doing is defined essential by the Department of Homeland Security, and it is listed um, the decommissioning nuclear stations as well as the operating nuclear stations are listed as part of the nation's critical infrastructure sectors. And uh, once again, the decommissioning plants are on that list. So we studied the information that we had carefully. We took a careful approach to our fuel transfer operations. We made sure that they were in compliance with our songs uh, protocol and uh, we are safely continuing that operation with regard to the remainder of the D, &D activities we're reviewing those now to in, to to see what activities can be safely performed uh, without introducing any additional risk to the station while we're under this protocol uh, next slide okay david Excellent, thank you very much. So um, I just want to remind everybody that the CEP is not a decision-making body, but an engagement body. Um, the meeting materials, is, it's normally our fashion to, more than fashion, our, our good practice to circulate those materials to the full CEP a week in advance to post them online. Um, it would be the understatement of the decade to say that there's been a lot in flux <laughs> over the last few weeks. And so those materials were only posted uh, last night um, and circulated to the CEP, and so I apologize for that, and, and, and uh, if we continue in this virtual mode, we'll have to figure out how to do that uh, in a more timely way so people can see the materials uh, 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 sooner. Um, for CEP members, I invite you to unmute your phone and chime in during the, during the presentation, and for the public, as I said earlier, we'll have a public comment period uh, in a little bit. So right now, uh, we're at the part of our agenda where we're going to have some, some community updates. Uh, so next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's five items we want to cover uh, uh, in macro picture uh, right now. First is on the federal legislation and appropriations. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, we care a lot about this because ultimately we want to get the spent fuel out of here in a responsible way to an interim storage site and or a permanent repository. Um, the, the only major development is covered in the local press quite well. Uh, that's happened since our last meeting is the, uh, the, the president's new budget uh, does not include any funding for Yucca Mountain, and that's related to the politics, the electoral politics of Nevada. Uh, my own view is that that's actually potentially good news, uh, in part because one of the hardest things to do politically in developing legislation for interim storage and getting the interim storage program going has been to, to put together a deal that has folks who want Yucca to happen 
along with folks who want interim storage to happen and other things to happen, the more that Yucca is seen not as, uh, as, as a real prospect, I think the easier it's going to be to get focused on interim storage with the big caveat that anything that costs money and anything that requires attention right now in the middle of a global pandemic with the economic uh, freefall that we're all in and the responses to that, that's not going to be high on the, on, the, on the radar. Existing legislation, existing appropriations do allow some continued progress by the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on interim storage. And both sites are advancing along as expected. The environmental reviews on the New Mexico site have just come in. They, they, they show no significant concerns, at least from an environmental point of view. Uh, we'll have an update later this year on interim storage questions and where we go with that. Um, the second item here concerns Representative Levin's task force report. And for that, I want to give the floor to Dan Stetson. Hi, David. Thank you. Um, the uh, Congressman Levin's Songs Task Force report has been uh, completed, and a press conference had been uh, previously planned. However, that had to be postponed. Uh, on March 16th, uh, Kyle from uh, Congressman Levin's office, actually, Kyle is uh, part of the meeting right now, but I'm just going to read your email, Kyle. It says, hello, all. Due to the ongoing coronavirus situation, the Songs Task Force report press conference is being postponed. We will follow up with rescheduling information when available. Stay safe, best Kyle. So that's the latest that we have on that. And we, we're, we'll wait, I'm sure after things uh, simmer down, uh, we'll hear back from Congressman Levin's office in terms of when the press conference will be rescheduled. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so next item here is the CEP closed session report. We had the first ever uh, closed session of the CEP membership. So an opportunity for people to talk um, off the record about what's working, what's not working, how do we make sure that the CEP's work is as useful as possible to the communities that are affected by the decommissioning of the plant, other issues that are on the horizon. I would say we spent a lot of our time talking about uh, two issues in particular. One is what does the CEP look like after fuel transfer operations are over? So after the fuel is out of the spent fuel pools, and into the ISPACY, the, the, the interim storage facility, um, you know, not knowing exactly what interim means, um, and with a continued gridlock in Washington, the prospect of that being even longer. Um, so once that situation has happened, which <clears throat> might be this summer, uh, depending on how things unfold with the pandemic, uh, then, then the question is what can the CEP do and organize, how can it organize itself so that it's, so that it's useful? And I think at, at that point, it looks like We'll probably go to a meeting schedule that is quarterly, as is in our charter, a requirement in our charter, but is um, uh, probably has two meetings a year focused on big topics like interim storage and like defense in depth at the SFC, so that people can be confident with what's happening there uh, for the long for the long term, if the long term is re is required, and two meetings that are more of a summary and update type. But that's still a work in progress. We welcome input from members of the community about, about that. The other thing we spent some time talking about is how can we get more of the material out of these meetings back into the hands of CEP members and the general public, especially elected officials, who are often getting questions about what's going on at the plant, and there's just a, a kind of avalanche of material that is available. And so one of the things we're going to start doing is after each of these meetings is offer a kind of crisp summary. I will do a dress rehearsal of that at the end of this meeting, a crisp summary of of what some of the key points are, and then we will very promptly uh, put that together into a note that we can send back out to all the CP members and also get out to the communities around the uh, around the, around the plant and a variety of other things. Um, so, so that's the report on that closed session. My guess is we're going to do that again, um, uh, you know, once a year or something like that. Because I thought that was a very helpful meeting um, uh, with the with the CP. Uh, the fourth item is an update on what used to be called the workshop on outlier uh, events and response strategy is now going to be a full CEP meeting. It'll be the next CEP meeting on May 28th, uh, format TBD, um, could be virtual, could be in person. My guess is we're going to be still virtual, but we'll see where we are and additional meetings if needed. I'm going to say a little more about that uh, in the next few slides, but before we go there, I just want to pause for a moment and see if there are any other members of the CEP who want to provide updates to the community about where we are, things that, where we are with things that are that are related to the plant and the decommissioning process? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the next CEP meeting, I want to take a couple slides and give a, a, a review of where we are. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is a meeting that has emerged uh, two years ago, uh, and then the events of August uh, 2018 and the aftermath of that meant that we had to put the planning process on on hold so that it could be planned properly. Um, <clears throat> uh, the current working title of it is about outlier events and response strategies. So the idea is. What are some of the extreme things that you know might happen at the site uh, when the site is an ISPASI only site, meaning it only has the spent fuel sitting there, like several other sites in the United States and, and many more uh, in the future? Um, what could what's, what what are some of the extreme things that could happen there, and what are the response strategies inside the fence line, outside the fence line in Orange County and San Diego? Uh, County, and then what are some, some of the potential impacts? What should the public know about this? And we've had uh, um, a lot of questions from the public about this. We've had a petition uh, that many members of the public have helpfully contributed to a variety of other uh, variety of other inputs. So the preparations are now moving very rapidly and extensively, and they've continued even though we're all we're doing everything uh, uh, virtually. And the agenda is now taking taking shape. Next slide, please. I want to talk about the process on this slide, and then, then in a moment I'll talk about the agenda where we are. So we've had multiple sources of community input on what are the questions that people want to have uh, answered. We've had external stakeholders uh, that I mentioned. We've had we've done over the last two months a survey of the city managers of all of the cities and all the communities that are uh, around the plant uh, in a broad sense of around the plant, so not just the ones physically adjacent, but also the larger. Uh, larger set of communities. We've enlisted a panel of experts to help us review um, uh, the different scenarios, the, the things that, that there could be outlier events. I'll talk more about that uh, in, in just a moment. We've had a planning committee since the fall of 2018 that went dormant uh, late in 2018 when everyone was focused on other things and then was reactivated and has been very active in the last uh, uh, in the last few months. Three in-person meetings, one meeting via Skype, I believe just last week. Uh, and I'll show the members of that in a little bit, but it's had members uh, from different segments of the community, CEP members, uh, representatives from the first responder communities from Orange County, San Diego, and of course people from, from Edison itself. And the idea has been to review and discuss the planning process um, and to engage with experts who can help us not tell us what this meeting should be focused on, but help guide us on which kinds of scenarios, outlier events are more consequential and which are less consequential. It became very clear early on in this process that we needed some expert help. People who do this kind of work and who look at SPCs and safety questions professionally from a variety of different backgrounds, we need we need some expert help to understand, you know, which kinds of scenarios are are uh, really of concern and which are of lesser concern, at least from an expert point of view. Um, and so uh, I went with some help to the National Academy of Sciences to the person who runs the board that does all of those National Academy studies on uh, nuclear safety and on nuclear risk and radiation. Uh, we consulted with several members of that board, identified a larger, uh, large group of, uh, uh, of experts, and we also in parallel identified through the planning, the, the planning committee and through Edison and the NRC uh, a set of scenarios that would seem to be plausible scenarios that we then put to those, um, uh, to those, to those experts. I'll show that list of experts in a, in a little bit. Uh, in that process, it became clear that um, there are fast moving events like terrorism, where you wake up one day and you have an event, and then slower moving events for which uh, it's a little easier to predict what might be happening, sea level rise, um, uh, groundwater intrusion, a variety of other, uh, variety of other things. And that, the, that distinction is very important because it affects the response strategies. I would say the bulk of the conversations with the experts around scenarios that we should be really attentive to are terrorism in the broadest sense, so both, both terrorism on the outside and potential insider, uh, uh, insider illicit uh, activity. And so we're going to see that in the agenda for the meeting that we'll talk about in, in a little bit, big chunk, big emphasis on that. I want to just emphasize that in this process, We've, we've had a whole series of plausible scenarios that have been discussed. Some are going to end up with more focus in the meeting, and some are going to have less focus in the meeting. All of them, though, are going to get answers. And so there's a, um, 
there's a library that's that's emerging uh, still to come uh, with uh, tech resources, technical resources, a variety of other resources that are linked to each of these scenarios of potential concern. Uh, there'll be a set of, of kind of explanation memos because quite often there's long, complicated technical documents that are not written in what I understand is English. Um, and so we'll write uh, a simple memos to help guide people as to what to look at and what the information is that, that, um, that uh, can be helpful. And then crucially, in the next week or two, I think, I will be able to put together a summary of this whole process of the inputs of information, the scenarios, where they came from, what all the experts thought about the different scenarios. I've just, I believe, yesterday gotten final clearance from the, from the last expert to be able to show all the individual expert responses, plus the summaries of the expert meetings uh, that looked at which scenarios are more consequential and less consequential. We're going to document all that, make it all transparent, all available to the public, so that people can kind of see what the process, not kind of, so people can see the process that we went through and at, raise questions and so on. We're going to do this quickly so that even though the meeting isn't until the end of May, there's an opportunity for people to look at this, to ask questions, to have questions answered, to go several rounds on that. Uh, next slide, please. This slide gives uh, just a kind of quick overview of uh, the agenda that's emerging for this meeting. Um, as I've already mentioned, the expert-driven process has really focused a lot on terrorism, not exclusively on terrorism. The community-driven process um, has focused a lot on sea level rise and, and other things that people, members of the community are, are, are concerned about. And we in the planning committee, if I can kind of speak about the sense of the planning committee, thought it was very, very important that this process, that the agenda reflect not just kind of what the experts thought was important, but also what uh, different members of the community, including what we're hearing back from city managers about questions um, uh, um, uh, of concern in the, in the local communities. And uh, that agenda is going to be adjusted, you know, in the coming months as, as this whole process un, unfolds. As I mentioned, we're going to uh, make sure there are answers for all credible topics and scenarios, so not just the ones that get a lot of emphasis in the meeting, but also all of them that come up uh, during, this, during this extensive uh, planning process. The meeting itself is going to focus on the scenarios, so what are some of the things that could go wrong, and what do we understand causally as to why that might happen and the response strategies. And so those will be the two kind of centers of gravity of the, of the, of the meeting. I want to emphasize that we're getting as much of the preparatory material put together now and out in the public space soon so that the public can ask questions in layers. We can ask questions soon. And there's already been a lot of questions asked, particularly through the planning committee, get answers. People can see materials well in advance so that you can anticipate what people are going to say during the public meeting, including what the experts are going to say and the first responder communities are going to say. You can put questions to them in advance. So that this is really um, uh, an extensive engagement process that is well informed by all the different segments of the community uh, in, in, in advance and is oriented around facts and information and documenting this and making all of that uh, alive on the website so that um, this information is useful, not just for the individual meeting, but beyond. The agenda itself is probably going to have some initial comments from different segments of the community. There's going to be a short segment about the basics of rad radiation and contamination, kind of radiation 101. Uh, then we're going to have a panel with four members of the expert group uh, talking about uh, plausible event scenarios, a panel probably with three people from the different first responder communities inside the fence line at Edison. San, uh, San Diego and Orange County, and public comment, uh, including public comment and questions in advance, so that some of the public questions that are posed in advance can be answered as part of the regular meeting. Next slide, please. David, could I? I'm just, um, as you were talking about the planning committee, and I seem to remember it might be later in the packet of materials we have, but for those people who don't have that ahead of time, Maybe you could explain how, or what, is there a list later on of who's on that and how you pick them? Because I think that helps people uh, understand the process. Yeah, thank you very much. So the, the next slide here is the planning committee. Sorry, this slide is, um, as a professor, this slide violates all of our norms of good slides. <laughs> it's got a lot of words on it. But um, uh, it's got a list here of the planning committee uh, on it. And the planning committee is the superset of people who've been very active in the community about these kinds of issues, such as through the petition. 
members of the CEP have expressed a lot of interest and concern about um, the long term at the SVC and wanted to contribute time and engagement around the planning committee. The CEP leadership, the three members, uh, uh, the, uh, of the chairman, vice chairman, and secretary of the CEP, um, key people from, um, uh, uh, from Edison as well, and then the key first responders uh, communities. And so that's the planning, uh, the planning committee as it stands right now. It was a little bit smaller initially, and then got bigger over time, including with additional input from the first responder community. I also want to thank the experts. I, I, I appreciate that everybody who's worked on this um, has done this, made enormous contributions as volunteers. I went to the National Academy of Sciences and asked their help on a volunteer basis to identify experts and help recruit them, help us recruit them. We went out to uh, ultimately eight or nine experts, I think. Almost everybody said yes. Um, uh, to, and then they all contributed their time on a volunteer basis to look at scenarios. They wanted additional information about the ISFC, so they got additional information about the ISFC. They gave written inputs. They attended meetings. So it's really just been, I, I have to say, this is public service at its best. And I really want to thank both the planning committee and the experts for that, uh, for, for their, their contributions. I want to just stop for a moment, Marnie, and see if that's responsive to the question that, um, uh, that, that you had asked. Yes, thank you. I, did, I didn't remember it was coming up so quickly. So that's exactly what I was hoping everyone would see and, and um, see the, the wonderful range of people that you've included. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's underscore, it's, it's not me. It's, it's the CEP, it's Edison, and it's all the different people who've been involved in this process who say, hey, we should involve X or we should involve Y. So I really appreciate that. I want to pause for a moment because I think we're. I think the next segment is going to be uh, an update from Doug. But before we go there, I just want to see if there are any other members of the CEP who would like to make any other uh, comments on this process about this next meeting or any other updates. Okay. Uh, Doug, I want to put the floor back to you. The next item on our agenda is a decommissioning update. Uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Uh, so, Manuel, you could just advance to the next slide, please. Um, just from the standpoint of the big picture, um, you know, we're focused on uh, really safe and prompt deconstruction. Um, following our notice to the public on January 22nd, 30 days after that, on February 24th, we started the actual limited decommissioning work here at the station. Um, some of that work involved um, actually removal of some waste from our containment structures, asbestos waste to make a safe condition for our workers. And um, in another couple of slides, I'm going to show you sort of a broad layout of how the decommissioning work looks over the next eight to 10 years. We like to say safe and prompt because we want to be, safety is our number one priority uh, throughout the decommissioning. And we are starting into the uh, industrial work now, and we're very careful to ensure that the work that we do on a limited scope basis does not interfere at all with safe fuel transfer, uh, which is the next subject here. We, we continue to safely transfer the fuel into the whole tech system, um, and Vince will provide an update on that a little later on, um, but that's on schedule. We're, we're doing about one canister a week, uh, which gives the workers plenty of time uh, time off, and time to rest and regroup. Um, uh, we're also uh, working on um, an inspection, inspection and maintenance plan for the whole tech system. That was a commitment me, we made to accelerate at the, um, you'll recall at the uh, Coastal Commission meeting back on October the 17th of last year. And as well, we're working on an, an, uh, an aging management plan uh, for the Arriva TN uh, fuel storage system, which will be presented to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the next license period on that system. And then, as we presented in prior meetings, we've um, initiated an effort, a strategic effort, uh, for location of the fuel off-site, and that includes a detailed transportation plan. So our, our expectation is for those plans to be, they're in development now, and to be ready, and uh, ready for us to take over and, and do some key actions uh, throughout this year the plan itself should be completed by the end of the year of 2020. Next slide, please, Manuel. 
These are our decommissioning principles. You've seen these before. Very much focused on safety as it's paramount now as we're getting into the physical D and D activities, and then in stewardship, um, both environmental stewardship. Uh, we've done a what I think is a pretty good job of implementing all the environmental mitigation plans. We've had um, preliminary inspections by representatives from California State Lands as well as the Coastal Commission on our mitigation plans, and I will say this effort continues. Uh, Ron, who is about to um, take over for me in this presentation today. Well, he's really the one in charge of our environmental mitigation plans here at the station. Um, and then engagement. You know, we thought this meeting was important uh, to have it online. It's important to connect. So these three principles, safety, stewardship, and engagement, just uh, I think are going to stay with us throughout the entire decommissioning. Next slide, please. Uh, for most of you that have attended meetings, know that we've uh, shown this slide many times. This is just the overall layout on our, our decommissioning work with major bars that show when we expect things to happen. The physical D&D &D work is about an 8 to 10 year window um, ending in uh, uh, 2028. We do expect to have all of the fuel and dry storage by mid-year this year, um, and which will obviously support some of the more important De, uh, deconstruction work coming up. Uh, next slide. As I indicated, I would talk a little bit about our deconstruction timeline. Here you see a chart that really shows the major work as it lays out throughout the decommissioning um, uh, eight to ten year window. And in future meetings, we'll dissect some of this work. We'll show you some pictures of, of work uh, taking place in the field. We'll show you We'll show you some of the actual work as we go through these physical decommissioning windows. Um, right now, there's actually um, a lot of work to do in the containment structures. These are the large structures that you see when you drive down Route 5 and look over at the plant, the large domes, as they're called. Um, the domes contain radioactive material. Uh, the reactor vessels themselves that will need to be uh, cut up and safely removed. And so there's just a lot of work in the containment domes. I would point to um, the first item, containment preparation and internal component removal. You can see that goes out um, about four years. And then if you move down the page, the third item from the bottom, containment building, domes, demo. So eventually, in the out years, 25 and 26, you will, if you're driving down Route 5 and you look over at the plant, you'll actually see the containment domes shrink because the, the technique we're going to use after the internals are removed is to actually um, push in on the sides very a very little bit at a time and uh, lower the structures to the ground. Uh, so um, I will tell you that the critical path work, the critical path for all the work, which is end-to-end -end schedule, goes right through those containment domes. The other work that you see on this slide, the electrical and mechanical systems, the building demolitions, turbine building, and, and the other work, including the underground utilities, all really is umbrellaed under the overall schedule. It has to do with um, the work inside the containment domes, which is a critical path. Finally, I'll point out that um, we're very committed to uh, remediating the station to uh, well under NRC uh, uh, requirements for decontamination. And you can see the final site survey bar there. We'll start engaging the Nuclear Regulatory Commission early as we go through de decommissioning work so that they're aware of our plans and they're ready to support with the final site survey requirements. And I guess the, the final thing I'll point out here is we're going to decontaminate the station to uh, what you would call resident farmer standards under the um, NRC rules for decommissioning, which is, uh, which is a, a, a very safe way to take an approach on uh, decontaminating, decontaminating the site. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to, if there's no questions from the panel, turn it over to uh, Ron Pontus, who will talk through some uh, environmental areas. Let me just pause for just a moment before we go to Ron, Doug, and just see if any members of the panel have any questions. I've got two, but I want to see if anyone else has a question. I'm not seeing any of the mics come off, so it looks like we don't. Hi, Mike, David. Go ahead, Marnie. I'm, I just, and I know this has been explained before, but it still confuses me on the on the slide before this one. The decommissioning plan. It taught, it shows the timeline, and then it it says that the 
what to, it says all fuel in dry storage, and it shows the at 2020, and then it goes all the way out to 2049. And I just would love to hear again the explanation for um, what that actually means for us. So thanks for the question, Marnie. Um, we're showing it this way because uh, we really do not have a fixed timeline for when the fuel will be shipped off site. So we're conservatively showing the blue bar here, all fuel and dry storage out to the end of 2049. Um, shipping the fuel takes could take up to eight or nine years to actually do the shipping depending on uh, what kind of um, uh, allowances are made for offsite fuel storage, um, uh, how you look at the sequencing of fuel from various nuclear stations. Uh, so we're showing it this way. We would, we would obviously like to be able to transfer the fuel off-site, the green bar there, under all fuel and dry storage much sooner. In fact, um, uh, by the end of this year, uh, most of our fuel would be ready to be shipped and, and, and licensed and ready to be shipped. It's just that there's no repository. So when we show this, we show it going out multiple years. Okay, thank you for reminding us that what we could do if we had a place. <laughs> thank you. Exactly, yeah. Any other questions people have? So uh, thank you very much, Marnie. So uh, by the way, I think maybe in the future we should make these bars that have um, unknown ends into arrows with question marks or something like that, because they could be a lot shorter if we're successful in changing federal law and a variety of other things, or they could be, or they could be longer. Um, I just want to mention that um, in the course of the planning for the next CEP meeting, we've had uh, one of our experts has raised the question of what the um, expiration and then potential renewal around nuclear liability would would mean. And so I think one of the issues that it's going to be very interesting for the very important for the community is is this ongoing stewardship of the site. So that regardless of what deadlines are put on whatever charts. The key point is that Edison has control over the fuel um, and has responsibilities to the plant and will sustain those responsibilities um, uh, until there's a, there's a longer term solution. One of the other things that's come out of the planning process for the next CEP meeting is the question of whether um, vibrations or extreme vibrations from the dismantlement process um, uh, of, the, of the plant itself could affect the SVC and the integrity of the SVC. And I think right now the consensus very strongly is no, but we're going to have more documentation around that to, to help the public understand what the concerns might be, why they're not uh, of concern, or what the possible responses might be. The question I have uh, to you, Doug, is on this slide here, um, I said actually the next slide, if you could just go to the next slide, please, Manuel. Uh, on this slide, it goes out to 2027, 2028. The experience at other plants when firms have been hired that specialize in the process of decommissioning nuclear plants, including the one that you've hired, Energy Solutions, which we've invited to a future meeting and I look forward to that. When they've really focused on this and had an incentive, they've done it faster than schedule. Do we have any sense of what the probability is of that? And if faster than schedule happens as is typical at other plants, how much faster, or is, or is there something about this site that makes you think 2027, 2028 is the right date to be focusing on for completion? Sure, I'll, I'll address that, David. Um, well, first to answer, or sort of go after your previous um, uh, remark regarding vibrations from the decommissioning work. We studied that as part of our environmental impact report that's on record uh, regarding potential vibrations that could occur from dismantlement activities and as they would be felt on the dry fuel storage pad and found that the, the actual the vibrations that we would expect would be very low compared to the rating of the dry fuel storage installations, both the Arima TN system uh, and the Holtec system. And we're happy to share that at the next meeting, uh, once again, just to refresh uh, everybody and, and pull those excerpts from the report. Um, uh, once again, the, the deconstruction timeline. So when you look around the country and look at various decommissioning efforts, um, some are, are successful, some run into issues. And typically where there's a scheduled delay, it is in the containment work, as I mentioned, in the reactor vessel cut up and the segregation of the higher level waste in the containment and, and doing all that properly um, 
uh, so that there's no challenges to worker safety, um, both radiological and industrial safety. So uh, that work right now for for us, for songs, is is approximately an 18 months to two year window. And that is actually where the critical path for the schedule will lie um, in the foreseeable future. Now, we've got pretty good confidence that the technology being used or that will be implemented by Song's decommissioning solutions, a joint venture between AECOM and Energy Solutions, is pretty good. They've learned some lessons from the last decommissioning effort at Zion Nuclear Station, and the equipment is improved from that effort. So there is a chance that we could improve on this schedule, but it's too early to try to handicap that. I mean, we're, we think we have a good solid schedule now laid out over um, roughly eight years. And, I, you know, if we're very successful in the work inside the containment, there's a chance to pull this in. And if we can do that safely, we'll get, you know, we'll obviously um, uh, keep the community informed of that as well. Okay, thank you. I think Paul Wyatt wanted to ask a question. Yes, I just want to try to recap what I think I heard Doug say in sort of the the perfect scenario, uh, if, a, if an off-site storage, an interim storage site would become available by the end of the year, we would be ready to start transfer. The fuel would be in a state to do that. And it could be transferred in eight to nine years is the, is the total transfer time. Is that correct? Right, so we, I, uh, Manuel, if you could go back to the overall timeline again. Right, thank you. So you can see we have transfer fuel offsite, and it starts roughly 2034, and it ends 2049, so that's 15 years. That's a very conservative window. Um, when a repository becomes available, we're not sure exactly the order and sequence that the fuel would be transferred in. So you can see a, a pretty conservative window here. Um, uh, the, under under current rules, under the Waste Policy Act, I believe the Department of Energy would be responsible for selecting which stations would move fuel and when they would move it. And so you can see a large window here. Um, you could speculate that if a repository opens up and San Onofre was given first priority and we were able to ship, you know, um, multiple, uh, multiple canisters a year, uh, upwards of eight to 10 canisters a year or even more. And we will have 123 canisters in total in storage that you can approximate a 10 year or maybe give or take 10 year window. But it is a sizable project, so I don't wanna um, uh, take away from that. But uh, you know, the, the bar that you see here is just an approximation. And I, I was trying to point out earlier that we would be, we'll be ready to transfer fuel. We would be if there was a repository available much sooner. And, and uh, the follow-up then, will we uh, begin the effort to really lay out the logistics and make sure we would know how we would do that in preparation so that we don't delay if it becomes available? That is, I don't, I don't, I would prefer not to start uh, lining up uh, all the equipment and, and rail equipment and so forth and, and schedule that after. Um, so if we work on what the sequence is, um, what equipment we would use, how much we could transfer a year prior to the repository, uh, it would definitely speed the process. So I think, uh, I guess my only comment here is I think we need to have effort ongoing on that even if we don't know where we're sh where and when we will begin to ship, we should be ready to move the day they say yes. Exactly, and I, I mentioned earlier, we have a strategic uh, plan and development for relocation of the fuel. As part of that strategic plan is included a detailed transportation plan. So we'll be putting all those pieces together. Uh, you know, what, what we constantly say is, how would it be if a facility opened up and we weren't ready? So the detailed transportation plan is being, it will be developed this year. Um, and we'll start really looking at what we need um, uh, to put that plan together. Great, thank you. Thank you. I think, you know, we're gonna have a meeting around, around the questions of where we are with interim storage, maybe the end of this year, maybe first quarter next year. We ought to make sure it's focused not just on the places to send spent fuel, but also on transportation, on the strategic plan, 
we should have the team back from Northwind once they've done their work. I spoke with Ernie Moniz about this a couple months ago, um, and I think everybody at that point would be ready to talk about what does a plan look like, what are the lead times needed, and I think crucially we need to pay attention to not just what do we need to do inside you know the organization, but also what help do we need regionally, including from the state of California, once it becomes a prospect to actually move the fuel. Excellent. I don't see any other microphones uh, uh, open or wanting to to comment, and so I want to move on to Ron uh, to Ron Pontes, who is manager of environmental decommissioning, uh, to give us his update. Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you, Doug. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to cover three three topics uh, this evening: uh, radiation monitoring, uh, liquid batch releases, the cleanup process for those and an ocean environmental monitoring. So um, good news, uh, the radiation monitoring monthly reporting system that uh, we've, we've got in place with uh, California Department of Public Health, the radiologic health branch, is up and running. They published their first report on March 10th, and uh, we can expect them to publish reports every month thereafter around the 10th of the month. So uh, what they're uh, providing is uh, high, low, and average readings off of each one of the monitors that are installed around the uh, dry storage system, and also uh, a control monitor that's some distance away from the dry storage system uh, for background, uh, to understand what the background radiation readings are. Um, now, uh, this, this information can be found in two places. It can be found on uh, the Radiologic Health Branch um, website. There's a link here that you can see. That's where you can find it. And we also link to it on the songscommunity.com website. So this, uh, again, the report that you'll see here when people look at it, it's monitored after a, a similar type system installed at the Prairie Island Nuclear Plant in, in Minnesota. And, uh, well, we're very proud to have this up and running, uh, transmitting this information to the folks that, uh, that are interested in knowing about the radiation here, radiation levels around the system. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this view is a, a, a photograph of the plant, and you can see uh, the four locations for the monitors. Uh, locations one, two, and three uh, are located near the new home system and uh, the whole tech system. And then you'll see location number four, that's our control location, and uh, so it's monitoring background. Now the, the typical readings that we're seeing off of these monitors, um, the background readings are 8 to 11 um, uh, millirem per, excuse me, 0 0.11 to, uh, to a low of about 0 0.008 millirem at the control. And then the other monitors uh, are running uh, around 0 .0, 0, um, 0 0.022 um, millirem uh, on average, so um, very low readings. Uh, if we can go, go to the next slide. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the batch release cleanup process uh, because last, uh, last meeting we had, I discussed the batch releases that we were making and mentioned that we clean up this water before we, we release it to the ocean. Uh, we clean it up and we sample it. And um, so this diagram here gives you some, it's a simplified diagram, but it shows uh, how we clean up the water. So on the upper left, you'll see a storage tank that takes the input from um, our various tanks and sumps. Um, that water is uh, processed through uh, a mechanical filter, which is a bag filter, then a charcoal filter, then uh, resin beds, a uh, cation bed, an anion bed, a mixed bed. Um, to clean up the water. So th this system mechanically cleaning it, processing it through the charcoal filter, and then those ion exchangers takes out all the impurities in the water, okay, and a, lo and a lot of the radiation too. The water then ends up in a process a release tank. Um, presently we're using a tank that's about, has a capacity of about 20,000 gallons. That tank, after the water arrives there, is recirculated for a period of time to make sure that it is well mixed uh, and not stratified in any way, and then we draw a sample. So that sample is then, uh, it's representative of the contents of the tank, and it's sent to a lab uh, where sensitive instruments measure what the radioactivity is in the, uh, in the water, and then uh, we prepare our, uh, our release permit here on site and process that through our operations group. And once they've, uh, once they've authorized the release, 
then um, we would make that 48-hour notice that we're required to make to the public. And then um, once that 48 hours is behind us, we can start the release. And you can see here on the diagram, the water uh, flows to the Unit 2 outfall. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you'll notice that there is uh, the uh, dilution flow. So that we have dilution pumps running, drawing water in from the ocean, from the Unit 2 and 3 uh, intake conduits. And that mixes there at the uh, Unit 2 outfall. And then it goes out, out to the ocean. Uh, more on that in just a moment on the next slide. But here, you'll notice that the water is also continuously monitored by a radiation monitor. Now, that sensitive radiation monitor, if it detected something outside of its limit, it would stop the process. So uh, we're continuously monitoring the, the release as we, as we make it. Now, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, we reviewed this slide at the last meeting. I just want to remind everybody how far offshore the release is made. Um, it's more than a mile. You can see that circle there on the left. Um, about 6,300 feet from the plant or from the shoreline is where the uh, release starts to enter the ocean. So again, it's uh, very well diluted. Uh, we've measured and monitored the, uh, the uh, contents of the release before we make it so we know what we're doing and uh, what the release is and what its effect is, um, then uh, make the release. Now these releases are taking about four, four to five hours to make. So they go uh, relatively fast, and uh, so that's where we're at on that. Now, what are we planning for the rest of the year? We've got 14 or 15 more of these releases to make, uh, so we will be working on that. As there was a question that came up last meeting was, well, how many how many releases do we need to make? You know, throughout this entire process over the coming years, and that isn't quite known yet. I mean, it depends on uh, the pace of the project, how much dilution we have to do how much cleanup we'll do on site before we make releases and so on, and just knowing those total volumes. So we haven't quite got all that down yet. We'll just report on these as, as, uh, as we go forward and we'll let everyone know how we're doing that. Now I do want to mention one other thing. Um, it's not related to these batch releases, but yesterday we did have uh, an unexpected uh, release uh, to the ocean from our sewage treatment plant. Yeah, uh, we had an upset condition in the system and uh, we released about uh, an estimated 7,000 gallons to the ocean of partially uh, treated sewage uh, through this uh, Unit 2 conduit that you see here. So we're investigating what the cause of that was, uh, and once we know that, we'll get our sewage treatment back online and um, bring it back up to the water that we processed through there is fully, fully treated um, before it's released. Now, we did make all the necessary notifications, um, including to the water board, San Diego Department of Health, uh, state parks, even the NRC, and a few other agencies. So um, we, we've followed our procedures and the requirements of our permitting, and we've made all those notifications. So that's, that's out there. So we're, again, we're investigating that situation. So if we can go to the next slide. OK, so the other good news, um, as part of our lease with the uh, California state lands, um, for the offshore conduits, we agreed to um, to uh, build an interactive map that you can find on our website that will show folks what uh, what's happening with the environment around the plant. So as I said before at the last meeting, we do monitor the environment uh, for the potential impact of the plant uh, in terms of radiation uh, released to the environment. And uh, we agreed with, uh, with in our lease to do this. And what we've always been monitoring these points, by the way, and it's always been reported annually in our radiological effluent monitoring uh, program report that goes to the NRC. But here, as we take these samples on the ocean side, we're going to report them as we get the information. So uh, there's a number of control locations. There's 19 of them. Uh, they, we monitor the ocean water. We are monitor marine animals like crustaceans and fish, for example, uh, ocean bottom sediment and beach sediment, and kelp. So those are the parameters, physical parameters that we monitor and will report on. So monthly water and then semi-annually for those other parameters that I just mentioned. Um, so you can go to this website. The link, the link is shown on the next page. But you can go to this website. You can click on any one of these uh, these locations, control locations 
or the uh, indicator locations. And you can uh, then relate that location and what we're monitoring for to a uh, report that's provided just at the bottom or just below the map. Okay? So we compare the results of the indicator locations to our control locations. So, you know, the control locations are mostly located far north of the plant, uh, so they're, they're not related to what's happening here. Now, if we can go to the next slide. So, um, I mentioned earlier that just, just below the map you'll find copies of the reports. We published our first report for the uh, ocean water samples that were taken in January. And uh, we'll uh, start publishing the semi-annual reports and continue to publish the monthly reports as we get the information. Now, I do need to remind you that it takes some time to get the results for these, these samples. So a technician goes and recovers a physical sample from uh, the parameter that we're monitoring, let's say ocean water. And then that sample is brought back to the site and it's packaged and then shipped to a, a laboratory that has sensitive instrumentation that can uh, analyze the, uh, the, in this case, water. And it, that takes about four to five weeks for that to, to happen and get, for us to get the results back. Once we have the results, we, take, we compare it to the control locations. And then uh, once we finish that comparison and that go through our quality assurance checks, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, fill out this report and get it posted on our website. So it takes, it takes several weeks before we can get the information. We'll soon have the February information up for uh, water, and then uh, also to the, uh, the, the we'll start the semi-annual ones uh, next month in April. We'll start collecting that information, and then, as I said, it'll take a little bit, with a little bit of a delay, we'll have that information posted. And uh, you can see a link here where you can find that information uh, that I was just discussing. And I think, maybe I went a little fast there, David, but uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to report on. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. Let me see if there are people have any questions. I'm confident they will. And by the way, the members of the CEP, if you just take your microphone off mute, I can see uh, Miracle of Miracles through Skype for Business that you want the floor, and I'll give you the floor by just seeing that. Um, let me ask you um, a question just about the materiality of this um, partially treated sewage release. So obviously we're in a different situation right now because the beaches are closed and the ocean is closed and people aren't out there. But in normal circumstances, would an event like that, which sounds like it happened without warning, would that be material to people using the, the, the beach resources and how would they know about it? It could be. Um, it, when we, that's why we have to make these agency notifications. For example, uh, notifying the San Diego Department of Environmental Health uh, they could assess uh, what they want to do with the beaches. They might uh, might ask uh, state parks to close the beaches and then require sampling of the beaches uh, to make sure that there's uh, no biological hazard or anything like that, uh, and then reopen the beaches afterwards. In this case, uh, my understanding is, is we informed uh, uh, San Diego Department of Health about this. My understanding is, is they, they um, assessed that this was not a significant event um, and uh, chose not to do any sampling. But um, um, in any case, if it had been a larger release or there was some other concern, then, then they would make those notifications to close beaches or so on. Okay. hope that answers your question, David. Thank you very much. Dan Stetson, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, Ron, quick question. Um, the 19 different uh, control locations, are those, what are those? Are those buoys or those sensors that are on the bottom? What physically are you using, or do you just go out there and sample periodically? Th those, uh, no, there's no, there's no buoys or markers like that uh, for, for these points. Um, you simply use GPS coordinates to go find it, and uh, so we're going back to the same place every time, and we collect the samples there. Now, fish move around. I mean, one of the, one of the parameters we, we monitor for are fish, so, you know, we don't get it exactly at the same place every, every single time. Uh, and kelp is another one. Sometimes kelp is not growing in a location, so we have multiple locations for kelp, and we'll collect it where, where we can find it in those locations. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, including from CEP members who are dialing in. If you're dialing in, just, just holler and I will get you on the list. Okay. Uh, thank David, you very much. Go ahead. This is John Taylor. John, the floor is yours. 
I was wondering, um, when they do these releases, what kind of radiation levels is the material once it's diluted compared to background? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, so when we when we make these releases and we make the 48-hour notice, John, we actually post what uh, the dose would be to uh, a receptor, meaning a receptor being a person that was receiving uh, a dose from this release. So um, to give you some idea, the total dose from the last release that we did was 0 0.002 um, total body dose to, a, to one of those receptors. Um, now the limit for us on an annual basis for the whole body is 6 millirem. Okay, so we were just a fraction of that, 0.03 percent of the total that we can release in a year with, the, with that particular release. So we likely will be less than even a percent uh, for these releases that we make for the remainder of this year. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, John. Any other questions from the CEP members? Okay, so I'm going to give the floor next to Vince Spilovsky, who is Director and Deputy uh, Decommissioning Officer, who's going to give us an update on where the plant is with fuel transfer operations, or because all simple ideas need an acronym, FTO. So Vince, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, David. Um, we want to go to the first slide there, Emmanuel. Okay, great. Okay, so a fundamental principle that we live by here at Songs is continuous improvement. And one of the ways we achieve that is by being a learning organization where people performing the work can easily identify issues and opportunities for improvement. Um, and we have a formal, robust process uh, program for doing that. Um, we accept all the feedback that we get from the field and do our best to turn it around into positive operational improvements. And that's what we've been doing with, fuel, with the fuel transfer program here at Songs to the extent that we've really become the world leading experts in performing this process. I'm going to talk about some specific examples of improvements that we've recently made in, in some later slides. Uh, but I also want to, men I want, to, I want to make a comment about the strong relationship that we, that we have with our, uh, between our fuel vendor, Holtec, and the Songs Oversight Group. Uh, we have an environment where people look out for each other's safety. They accept and appreciate coaching in order to support that principle of continuous improvement. <clears throat> Over the past few months, um, we've gotten to a point of reliability and predictability where uh, we can do a safe transfer evolution of 37 assemblies from the spent fuel pool into a dry storage module, and that, that can occur in less than five days. Uh, this gives the crews uh, su sufficient rest over the weekend and thereby, thereby uh, avoiding potential impacts of fatigue. Last week, we loaded the 55th canister out of 73 total into the UMAC system, and we expect to continue at this pace and complete the project this summer. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Manual. Thanks. Um, we're going to take a look at some pictures of the uh, independent spent fuel storage installation, or as we often call it, ISFACI. Um, if we jump to the next slide, <coughs> Manual. Um, here you can see uh, a view of our ISFACI taking from the it's taken from the northwest corner. Um, what you can see here is the lids of the uh, 73 storage modules, and uh, there's operations taking place in the background there. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see a close-up of that operation. Um, this is what we call the stack-up configuration. And what we're seeing here is a transfer cask, and you can't see it, but there is a loaded fuel canister inside it. Um, the transfer cask is bolted. Uh, to the top of the storage module. Um, around the transfer cask is the VCT, which stands for Vertical Cask Transporter, and that's the uh, tracked vehicle that moves the cask onto the ISFACI pad, and it also contains the crane function, that's the towers that you see there, and that's what lowers the canister into the storage module. Uh, the workers in the picture there um, gives a scaled perspective uh, perception of the, the size of the, the transfer cask in the VCT uh, crane tower. So we'll go to the next slide. Before, I'm sorry, Vince, before you go on, can you just, um, I assume this photograph is taken before the era of social distancing. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah two guys hanging out next to each other right in the foreground. Help us understand how hard it has been to do social distancing in all these different modes. You know, for example, sure. you've got a shift arriving. They presumably all are now arriving in staggered form as opposed to all at the same time. How hard has that been um, and how much extra duress is that putting on the crews? Right. There, there are very few operations where we uh, have to have uh, people standing close together. The, uh, all the workers there have, have headsets and they, they work very well. They're kind of like the Bose noise canceling headsets. So they don't have to be close uh, next to each other. There are plenty of the, um, the displays that, that each one can hold one separately if they, if they need a display. So um, really in this part of the operation, um, it's not, uh, not necessary at this point to have people right next to each other. So. Uh, they're able to keep their distancing. Yes, this did. Ha this picture was taken uh, months ago. Hey, David, if I could make a comment also to augment um, Vince's response, that would be great. Um, yes, absolutely. Sure. Um, so I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay. So um, as part of our, our stand down following the governor's order, we, uh, Vince and the leadership team here, the whole tech leadership team, we had discussions with all the workers to make sure they understood our protocol, they understood our social distancing requirements, they understood simple things like when they show up for shift, they stagger as they go, they stagger um, people as they go through our security building, and during their pre-job briefs, they actually use social distancing. We actually expanded the pre-job brief room so that they could do that. So there's a lot of a lot of moving parts that went into the protocol. Uh, but but the, so far, our, in our observations and our, our field observations and, and other forms, we've noted that they they're they're compliant with that, and they've given us some good suggestions for um, social distancing. There is some physical work where they have to work side by side, particularly in the spent fuel buildings where they're welding the the canister lids on, and we have other measures in place to minimize um, potential spread of, of of the virus during that work. Okay, thank you very much. Vince, uh, back to you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Daniel. Okay, so now I'll talk about some of those uh, specific improvements that we've made. Um, for the leveling and alignment of the canister during download, uh, we've added a process for making the pad area around the module more level using spacer shims that can be placed underneath the tracks of the VCT. Um, we've also made procedural enhancements that provide uh, quick reference guidance to the operator for making adjustments with the crane. And we've uh, also figured out how to add some more cameras, and that gives the operators more visibility of the canister as it passes through the module. All these improvements have made the operator's job easier during the canister downloading process. Uh, I want to mention a situation that we had during the download of the 49th canister. At the very bottom few inches of the storage module, there are angled support gussets. Um, they kind of act like a funnel. And the canister itself has angled edges around the thick bottom plate, and it matches up nicely with the gussets, so the canister will slide into place if it isn't perfectly centered. Uh, when it is off-centered, which occasionally happens, as it did um, on this particular download, we'll see a reduction on the load cells, and we call that an underload condition. Um, the canister is still supported by the two slings, uh, but the contact that occurs at the gussets will briefly cause a reduction in the load. And when that happens, the operator stops the process at that point, and then he or she uh, makes sure there's no underload upon resuming. Uh, with the new cameras in place, we were able to see the subtle movement of the canister and then use that information to make procedural changes to help prevent underload conditions in the future. So if we go to the next slide, another experience that we had was on canister 51, um, where we had a component fail during the drying uh, on the drying system. Um, that component was the blower, and which uh, circulates the helium, and uh, it's not a it's not a safety related function, um, but there are there are, are a lot of moving metal uh, parts in the blower motor, so when it does fail, it gets pretty hot. Um, it's not an uncommon occurrence. Uh, it's happened before with that incident, but this time uh, there happened to be a small piece of weather stripping on the housing of that motor, and as the housing heated up, 
the piece of material um, ignited. So there was a flame about the size of what you'd see from a lighter, uh, very small, but, and they, they were able to put the flame out immediately with a single squeeze of the fire extinguisher. Uh, but any fire, no matter how small, is something that we take very seriously. Uh, so we performed a thorough evaluation to determine the cause. And uh, since then, we've made necessary changes so we can avoid that from happening in the future um, in the unlikely situation that we, that we have another blower failure. So if we can go to the, uh, the last slide, please. Uh, we had a power outage at the station back in January. Um, a, a typical cause, a, a branch knocked, uh, knocked out a transmission line. There were heavy, heavy winds that day. Um, and the a line that powers the station uh, was, was lost. And we, we uh, were out of off-site power for about 45 minutes. Um, our on-site backup power sources kicked in right away as expected. And we went into our abnormal operating procedures. Um, as far as the, the fuel transfers were concerned, uh, we were in the drying process at that time and had no problem maintaining a seamless uh, safe condition. So the power outage didn't have any impact on the fuel transfer program. And um, one last note, in, in reviewing the event, we did determine that um, we had some improvements to make with respect to uh, emergency lighting in a few areas of the plant. So we've uh, since made those, those improvements. And I think that's uh, I think that's my last slide. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I want to see if any members of the CEP have any questions. Um, anyone? Anyone? Okay, excellent. Well, Vince, thank you very much for your comments. Um, and I think we're gonna uh, next slide, please. I think we're going to take a break now uh, before we do public comment. Uh, I want to just um, say a couple words about what to expect. Um, where people have sent in their names in advance, we've already started a list. Uh, during the break, I'll get an update on that list. I believe Roger Johnson is number one on the list. So, Roger, prepare your comments for uh, five minutes or so from now. If anyone else wants to be on that list, we're going to be opening up the chat function. Uh, during the um, during the break, and so you can click on the chat function and um, chat. And in particular, if you could chat by saying your name uh, um, and that you want to be on the on the list. And if you're dialing in by phone, to indicate at least the last three or four digits of your phone number, so we know which line to open. And then we'll see how this goes. Uh, and if this turns out to be a nightmare, we'll have to figure out technically a different way of doing this. But um, please, please do bear with us. Um, so let's everyone take, uh, it's uh, 6.47 right now. Let's come back um, uh, at, at uh, 6.55 or so, a couple minutes before. Take a short break, be safe, um, have a slice of pizza or whatever you have for dinner at home. And um, uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. So thank you very much.
Okay, we're getting ourselves resituated here. Um, maybe Sanjay, if you could make sure the chat is activated, if that indeed is what we are going to do, so that people can can add their names to the to the list. We've got six people on the list right now. First is Roger Johnson. Second is Charles Langley. Just in a moment. Uh, uh, in a moment. So the instant messenger is now on, which I've been calling chat, which is in, indeed the same thing. Uh, you never know these days. Um, so if you want to go to the instant messenger or the chat, you just click on what looks like a little call out box from a cartoon on the top of the uh, Skype for Business app, and you can chat away. Ideally, you would chat away with your name to get on the list. Um, I've got six people on the list uh, right now. Uh, first is Roger Johnson. And so, Sanjay, could you please uh, open the line for, uh, for Roger Johnson, who is um, uh, on, the, on the, the web version? Roger, your, your mic is open, and the floor is yours. but we don't hear you. Uh, Roger? Roger, you must be on mute. Well, his mic, his mic shows himself unmuted, but there may be other muting. Okay, okay. Oh, there you go. That sounds good. Yeah, great. Right. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the kinds of releases we can expect in the next seven or eight years. These are all going to be liquid batch releases, no atmospheric releases. And um, there's going to be an enormous amount of rubble, and I'm wondering how you prevent it from being washed into the ocean, say, when it rains, uh, particularly with contaminated things like the inside of the domes, about four inches. You're going to scrape that off because and, and, and cart that away, and it, it's going to go to Cleve, Utah uh, for a classier grader. Uh, how many truckloads of this are going to be? So a bunch of related questions about what can, we can expect during this long deco uh, this this um, demolition process. Okay. Oh, great. And, and, and uh, is there anything else you want to say? No. Well, no, those are just the um, – Okay. Uh, you could, if you want, I'd be interested to know what's the latest on the conduits in the ocean. Yeah. So let me let me put that also on the, con on the, on the list here. And as is our norm, we've got six people on the list right now. I'm sure a few others will sign up. Charles Langley will be next. And just as a reminder, Dan Stetson and Jerry Kern are going to keep all the questions. They're going to get responses back and forth. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure that Doug and others will be able to talk about uh, all those items, and I can even say a little bit, having been to Zion and observed the many uh, train loads coming out of there. So, Roger, thank you very much for your question. So, next on our list is going to be Charles Langley, and so Sanjay, if you could move the microphone virtually as we're speaking to Charles Langley, who is also on the app. Um, uh, that would be that would be great. Thank you, Charles. The floor, the mic is open. The floor is yours. I will note that there, there are two Charles Langleys on here on the on the web version. So I'm not sure why. I guess both of them are open now. Uh, Charles, if, if you're there, if you could say a little bit, say just say a couple words so that we can hear your voice and know that we've got the right microphone. Uh, David Manuel here. While we're waiting for uh, Charles, uh, um, I did uh, was able to connect with Charles and, and actually Nina as well earlier this afternoon. Uh, Nina, I think I think the reason you're probably seeing too is um, uh, Nina was having trouble uh, logging in separately, so they'll they'll speak one after the other. Okay. That's great. So Charles Langley and then Nina Babiars. Uh, are Charles or, Lan or Nina, are you there? And after them will be Mandy Sackett. We still can't hear you. Uh, okay. Let me suggest that we um, maybe Manuel, you could send them a note, an email, or a text, or semaphores or whatever. We'll do. And uh, we'll come back to them next. Let's go to Mandy Sackett next. Um, so Sanjay, if you could open the, move the microphone to Mandy Sackett. Mandy, the line is open for you. The floor is yours.
Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yep, now we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Hi, Mandy Sackett representing the Surfrider Foundation. Um, so, yep, just a few topics to cover. Thank you for the updates tonight. Um, I do want to first mention that we are really concerned about the 7,000 gallon sewage spill from the plant yesterday. Water quality is really core to our mission of protecting our ocean waves and beaches. Um, and you know, we've noticed that no notifications have gone out or been made to the public, and we think that's really prudent and needs to happen ASAP. We've also made that request to the San Diego Department of Health, um, and you know, we're hoping that as Southern California Edison can also take it upon themselves to respond more proactively. Um, State Parks has closed parking at their beaches as of yesterday, but pedestrian access is still allowed. So we can expect people that will still, you know, possibly be recreating over the next few days and especially this weekend. Most people walk or bike anyway to Trestle's Surf Break, which is adjacent to the plant. And they're like to turn out in droves again as they did last weekend. Uh, it looked like 4th of July down there, which you know we are not encouraging. We're reminding everyone to, of course, respect all beach closures at this time, but um, thus far the ocean is not closed for recreating. So you know, we, we're really urging Southern California Edison to conduct water quality monitoring by tomorrow at the latest and posting those results to inform weekend access. And um, definitely interested in more information about how this happened and what's being done to prevent it for the future. And like I mentioned, we've also contacted um, San Diego Department of Health and State Parks with these same requests, but really hoping that Southern California Edison can take some more um, proactive and corrective actions. Um, okay, and then on another note, we'd also like to thank Edison for posting notifications again um, on their website before any batch radiological effluent releases take place. But we um, we'd like to request that the community members be notified somehow of those postings, either by notifying news agencies or sending an email notification. We all, you know, we all um, don't always check the song CEP website every day. And so, you know, we deserve to be able to make informed decisions when we go to the beach. And so we think that would be prudent and transparent of Southern California Edison to implement. Um, and then we're also curious, um, I was a little bit confused about how in the beginning of the presentation, it seemed like some, uh, it seemed like it, you mentioned that the, um, fuel transfer and decommissioning activities were paused due to um, the COVID-19 response, but then later on it seems like they, ha they hadn't been paused. So I'm interested in clarification on that. Um, and then finally was wondering if Southern California Edison could provide us with an update on its aging management plan, whether that we can expect a draft for public review or what the public input process will be on that. Um, and thank you for the update on the fuel transfer plan. That was all good to know. Um, and I think that's all I've got for me. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your comment. And I assume your comment about the aging management plan also relates to the Coastal Commission submission that is uh, uh, due shortly. So we'll get we'll get answers to that uh, later yeah. in this meeting. Let's go back to now Charles Langley um, and Nana Babiar's Sanjay, if you could open up those two microphones, and Charles, the floor is is uh, is is yours. Let me just see what's going on. Yeah, your microphones should be should be open. So, Charles, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, sorry about that. I my question is this the um, the Edison sorry I'm getting a, a kind of a doppelganger effect here I think yeah hey Charles computers, um, if two computers open uh, if you could turn one of them on mute so just there's one microphone would be great I 
now we can, can we hear you Charles we still can't hear you uh, Charles try again we'll be going to Paul Blanche after Charles and Nina so we we may have to take another shot at that. I see a, one microphone called Charles Langley is just muted. And Sanjay, if you could come your, bring yourself off mute, what other microphones do we have here for them? Hi, this is my, can you hear me? Yeah, that's very echoey. So, Um, why don't you, if it, maybe while you're speaking, you could turn the volume down, or if there's another microphone open, turn that off. But, but um, yes, we can hear you, which is the big echo. This is better. I left, I left the room. Oh, great. That's good. Good. Uh, so do you want to speak first and then have Charles do second? That'd be great. Or okay. I can hand the phone back to him. Whatever you guys want. The floor is yours. Thank you. Public Watchdog sent an open letter yesterday to San Diego County Supervisor Jim Desmond with a request for Edison to halt the simultaneous demolition and nuclear waste burial during the COVID-19 pandemic. We commend Edison for to have the common sense to partially halt the unessential demolition. We remain stalwart in our remaining request to also halt the nuclear waste burial as well. Edison's history of halting the radioactive nuclear waste burial has always been and only been after a failed canister design and a near miss drop. As Song's history has proven, movement of the waste always presents risk, and that risk may not only deter first responders' attention away from our current COVID-19 crisis, but also harm the very team of first responders we are all depending upon. All first responders we've inquired directly with have no or little training specific to radiological incidents. I know because I've personally surveyed many of them. Radiological exposure is not like our fires. You can't see it or smell it. Like COVID-19, radiation is another invisible threat that may pose the ultimate risk to our first responders. They would have no idea if their untrained actions would put themselves and the public they serve at risk. As Song's history has proven, movement of the waste always presents risk. Risk may only not, on, not only divert first responders' attention away from our current COVID-19 crisis, but also harm the very people we are depending upon. Since Edison has never conducted a risk assessment of the radioactive burial, the damage that could be done in our current circumstances is incalculable. Now we find recent history of problems downloading in a fire, both requiring procedures that needed mod required modifications. Mother Nature forced her winds recently, resulting in a loss of power and yesterday a plumbing problem. History shows that the burial won't be halted until something else goes wrong once again. Unfortunately, if that should occur, the halt would be too little, too late. We don't plan for a best case scenario. We prepare for a worst case scenario. There's no logical reason to continue the burial other than Edison's perverse monetary incentive. If you continue the burial, at least have the decency to stop the hypocrisy, saying you're doing it safely with stewardship and community engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next is Charles, uh, Charles Lyman. Okay, I'm, I'm here. And uh, uh, just very briefly, Doug Bowder said that radioactive water is being discharged. I thought I heard him say 450 feet from offshore, but the slide said 6,000 feet. And I'm wondering if we could get some clarity on that. And the, the real question though I have is, Will Southern California Edison make the camera inspection videos of the canisters inside the silos public? The NRC had access to the video of the damaged canisters, but returned them to Edison on the grounds that they are proprietary. These videos, which show damages to the cans, were paid for by the public money from the ratepayer-funded decommissioning trust fund. So my question is, why are publicly funded videos showing corrosion and canister damage 
being suppressed? And why did the NRC return those videos to Edison instead of making them public? And I'll sign off and listen for a reply, if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Charles and Nina. So next, we're going to go to Paul Blanche and then Donna Gilmore. So Sanjay, if you could move the microphone to uh, to, to Paul to Paul Blanche um, next. Paul, the floor is yours. And Sanjay, the last four digits are three one one nine. If Paul is dialing in by telephone. Paul, can you hear us? I don't see him on the um, apps here and nor on the telephones. Uh, maybe we could go to Donna Gilmore um, next and then let's call Paul and find out how he's uh, connected and then we'll get him on next. Uh, and then after that will be Kale Walker. So we have Donna Gilmore, then Paul Blanche, then Kale Walker. Donna Gilmore, I see your microphone's open. Donna, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear, thank you. Okay, great. Um, a couple of things. I have a, a question about the, um, the monitoring system that's installed. Where is the, the radiation detector part? Is it behind the glass or, or where's that located? Um, on those uh, monitors in the cabinets. That was one question. Uh, another is, uh, I've been researching this coronavirus, and uh, there's a report out uh, that says that it will last in the air for three hours. Uh, so distancing is not going to cut it in terms of protecting the workers. Um, and there's no way to detect uh, if, if any of the workers have the virus. Now, I know Edison has always said the pool is safe, the dry storage is safe. So I do not understand what the urgency is to risk the employees, their families, our families, and the exponential spread of this virus. I mean, 40% of the people that get this virus get pneumonia, 20% critical. We have our own. Uh, uh, Chula Vista and Coastal Commission, Commission, uh, Commission Chairman on a ventilator right now as we're having this meeting. What is possibly worth uh, having these employees and the rest of the community at risk? This thing is growing like wildfire. The governor says over 25,000 people in uh, California uh, will have this virus in, in eight weeks. Well, that was a week ago, so now it's seven weeks. So I don't understand what is so critical that it can't be put on hold in terms of the loading or the, the decommissioning. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for your comment. Um, I have a message here that, that Paul Blanche is no longer on the call, and so we're going to go next to Kale Walker. And I just want to say before we go to Kale Walker, um, uh, if anyone else would like to make a public comment, uh, send us and go to the instant message uh, or chat function. Uh, and uh, and put your put your name on that list. So, uh, Kale, it's Kayleen Walker, uh, Sanjay on the uh, participants list. So your microphone is open, Kale. The floor is yours. Kale, can you hear us? Why don't you say a couple words? Your microphone is open. Uh, Kale, we still can't hear you. Um, Sanjay, why don't you send Kale an instant message, or we have a telephone number here. Why don't you call Kale, uh, or somebody call Kale, and just see if, if there's a way. Let's leave the microphone open in case something fixes itself there. But Kale, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay. Why don't we, um, let's do the following. Why don't we start in on some answers? I'll ask Manuel and Sanjay to start to find out if, if Kale can join us. Kale, uh, one, uh, one last uh, go at this. Kale, are you there? 
Uh, why don't we call Kale directly by phone we'll, and send me a message and we'll interrupt the, the answers. But let's start with the answers because a lot of really good questions here. Um, and so for that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dan Stetson and Jerry Kern. Uh, maybe Dan, start with you and, and I put some of these questions to the folks. I've kept some notes as well. Sure, David. Thank you. Um, the first series of questions actually came from Roger Johnson in, in terms of what type of releases we might expect. Um, are there going to be releases into the atmosphere as well as into the ocean? Um, what's being done? I'm sorry, there's a number of questions here. So what's being done to make sure that the rubble from the demolition doesn't end up into the ocean water itself? Uh, how many uh, truckloads um, do we expect and what's the status of the conduits? It, it may be that some of these questions are gonna be addressed in more detail in some of our, our future meetings, but uh, those are the questions uh, as best I could jot down from Rod. Uh, Dan, this is, this is Doug Bowder, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a first approach at this and then um, hand it over to Ron Pontus, who is directly overseeing the environmental work. Um, uh, as Ron indicated, there will be a number of radiological releases, batch tank releases throughout the decommissioning effort. Each one of those releases will follow the process Ron described uh, to minimize any radioactivity. And I would also like to point out that the fractional amount of radioactivity released to the ocean is for the entire series of releases is far less than um, when the plant, um, the plants were operating during the operating years. Uh, but we're obviously very sensitive to that and, we're, and we want to lower the amount of um, radioactive water released as much as possible. Getting to dust, um, there's a dust mitigation plan as part of the environmental impact report and associated conditions and there's dust mitigative measures. I'll let Ron talk a little bit about that. Um, um, there are there are no planned, um, I would say, gaseous or other sorts of radiological releases. However, we during parts of the demolition effort, we will be doing environmental sampling, local, a local radiological sampling at the point of work, um, to to uh, to make sure that that is not the case. Um, uh, Ron. Um, if you're on and you can activate your microphone, a little more depth on a couple of these topics uh, would be good. Sure. Thanks, Doug. Um, so for the dust uh, situation, if we rubbleize the plant, uh, we'll use water to uh, suppress the dust so we don't have dust rising out of the plant, for example, and, and spreading everywhere. So we're going to rely on water to do that dust suppression. The other thing that we'll make use of is uh, for the demolition inside the plants where before we get to what's called open air demolition, we'll have the plant tented, um, those areas tented and with ventilation systems running so that we can um, uh, monitor any releases that are made to the air, uh, um, you know, filter and monitor those before they're uh, made, made to the atmosphere. Um, so I wouldn't expect that we're going to have any, any, um, any kind of sizable release to the atmosphere. Again, like Doug said, Releases to the water would be uh, just a fraction of uh, what we've released in the past, so we're not expecting any anything uh, any problems with that. So tents, dust suppression using water, monitoring the dust, um, that, that's what we're going to do there. Now I did hear a question about uh, the, how many trucks. Uh, I can tell you that most of the waste is going to leave here on rail cars. So once we enter the active demolition phase, one of the first buildings that comes down is the building I'm in right now. This is our administrative building, and it will make room for a rail spur. And on that rail spur will be parked gondolas uh, to uh, take the waste away. Those are basically rail cars that are covered and sealed, and that waste will be hauled by rail up to uh, Clive, Utah. Uh, there will be some truck shipments, but they, but they should be few in number compared to the volume of waste that goes out of here by uh, rail. That's thank you. Thank you very much. I want to just um, mention that Tim Brown is former vice chairman of the CEP and told um, his work as a public servant uh, in San Clemente uh, became much larger. Tim and I did a site visit to Zion to talk with them about their experience and as part of it walked the site and saw the rail staging area and maybe if we have those photographs from that visit we can put the, share those again. 
uh, with Roger and other members of the community because they give you some sense of the scale of the rail of the, of the rail operations and the tarpaulins and the tents that are being used for, for dust control. Uh, Dan, does that cover the questions that you wanted to put forward? And then I want to go to, to Jerry for the next tranche of questions. Pretty much, but Ron, with reference to the status of conduits, uh, I guess it's our understanding that the conduits are going to remain in place for a while until uh, uh, fuel is transferred and the pools are drained. Is that and then actually you're going to be abandoning them and most of them in place and removing some of the uh, risers and diffusers. Is that accurate? Yeah, that that's right. So today the uh, unit. Three and unit two intake conduits are in service, drawing water in for dilution purposes. And any water that we discharge goes out through the unit two conduit. Those conduits will remain in place until um, the until some stage of the demolition is at a point where we no longer have to make any releases. Now that may take take a while. Um, that may take uh, until 26 or 27 year 20, 2026 or 2027. Uh, as uh, we bring down the plant. But, um, you know, at that point, the or much earlier than that, the larger releases uh, from the water that's stored in the plant today, that water should be out of here by 23, year 2023. Um, and then the rest of it would be, you know, water that we've been using for suppression purposes that may collect or rainwater that collects in the, inside the plant. That will have to be processed and released too. So we'll likely keep the conduits in place uh, through year 2026, 2027, that time frame. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before I go to Jerry for the next tranche of questions, we have uh, Kale Walker on the line here. And Kale, we need you to press star six, I believe, if I'm reading my messages correctly, uh, so that you can ask your question. Kale, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. You have to press star six. I think that was the problem. All right, so, um, oh, so many things I'd like to talk about. Um, first, how are you doing? How, how's everyone feeling? I hear that that's one of the questions that they use to screen the workers before they go to work regarding COVID. And I want to second the everything that Donna said about this. Uh, I mean, we're in a, a global emergency. Loading these canisters is absolutely non-essential to anything. In fact, it increases risk on all sorts of levels. I think it's a, absolutely, it reflects an absolutely irresponsible management of the facility for you to proceed on that. That's one. Uh, number two, I'm wondering if the, you have plumbing, if you have flush toilets. Do you have flush toilets at the facility with this uh, uh, sewage release? Because uh, that's a sanitary issue. I don't know whether you guys have plumbing going on there. Um, that's a question. Um, regarding the aging management program that is supposed to be submitted to the Coastal Commission by March 31st, has that been done? I would be very curious to uh, see that public re report made public. Uh, aging management, according to the NRC, requires the ability to inspect the canisters which we know that they can't really be inspected according to the senior inspector, but or repair, or if there's a problem to be able to take the canisters out of service. But I'm, I'm wondering what kind of aging management program design that Edison has come forward with, and that would be great to see that before March 31st, considering that uh, your permit for decommissioning is dependent on that special condition 19 of the decommissioning permit. That's a question in there somewhere. Um, there's, I'm wondering how you feel about the Holtec notice of violation regarding the scraping and gouging that occurred at, at San Onofre, although Edison was not, um, you know, noticed uh, a violation, even though that's the condition that Holtec is now being uh, uh, noticed on, notice of violation on. So in general, I feel like uh, Edison should acknowledge that they've been a research and development uh, a trial test and uh, uh, kind of a test case for this below ground system, partially below ground system. And um, it's just uh, remarkable, remarkable on so many levels. I would suggest you stop the loading until this COVID-19 thing subsides, please. 
You're risking the, the health and safety of essential nuclear workers. Everybody else is staying home. Why are you loading those canisters? There's too many problems with that system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. We'll, we will put those to folks um, as we put these, the rest of the answers. Um, so thank you very much. I think that's um, it in terms of um, uh, um, uh, in terms of people who want to have, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Brady, I see, would like to to have the floor. So uh, Sanjay, can you put open the uh, microphone for Sarah Brady? I saw her her um, her name on the on the chat. Sarah Brady, the floor is yours. Your microphone's open. Sarah. You have to maybe push star six if you're on your phone, but I don't think you'd be on your phone if you're on the uh, web or the app version. Okay, let's do the same thing. Let's go to some answers, continue to get some answers. I'm gonna go to Jerry Kern next and maybe uh, Manuel or Sanjay or someone could talk to Sarah Brady and we'll, we'll make sure we get her questions in front of us. But now to, to um, Jerry Kern. Jerry okay, Kern. thank you, David, and actually, Kale Walker and Mandy Sackett had very similar questions. So I, I think this, you know, I'll combine them. And this had to do with the sewage spill. And, you know, with the notifications that went out, who gets notified and how does that notification get out to the public? Um, the ongoing question from Mandy was, is there water quality monitoring in place now since that spill happened? Um, then, to the COVID thing that it was paused, you know, the downloading was paused and then the fuel transfer was resumed. What was part of that decision and why that happened? And then the last part uh, for both people was the aging management plan and the public release of that information. So I, I guess those, there was four similar questions between Mandy and uh, Kale. Let's let's start with just the let's start with the issue of the release and notification. I'm horrified to find from Andy that not everybody's on the sonicscommunity.com website every day, but be that as it may, clearly some questions from the public about notification and how to get the word out. Let me put the floor to Doug Bowder to begin that, and then we'll come to the other elements about about COVID-19 stop, this calculations you've done there, and the aging management. Okay, um, if everybody can hear me fine. Thank you, David. And I'll, I'll ask for Ron, uh, Ron for some help on the um, on the, the sewage spill and the, those notifications again, just as a reminder. We do put the um, release notification for the batch tank releases on the website with a 48 hour advance notice. <clears throat> we have looked at ways to push that out to to um, everybody who's subscribed to the website. It's 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 something we're considering, but to be honest, we think that noticing the website is a pretty effective mechanism for doing it. Um, uh, but we'll take that back uh, under review again and look at the, the process itself from, from from A to Z to make sure it's working. Um, uh, so so appreciate the comment from, from Mandy on that. Um, getting back to the um, the common theme around fuel transfer. Um, I, think, I just I'm wanna, sorry, Doug, Doug yeah. before, you, before you go to fuel transfer um, and, and the question of continuation during the pandemic, I think what I also heard from Mandy was the, some difficulty apparently also getting information about this from San Diego County. And I don't know what the issues are there, but it would seem that to, for us to figure out how to connect the dots, if the dots are not, not connecting and that information is not getting back to people who ultimately are using the beaches, although I would urge during the current situation that people not be using the beaches the way they've been using them. Well, yeah, so um, so this, this uh, sewage spill, um, occurred yesterday and actually last night um, we made yesterday afternoon and last night we made our notifications to the san diego county um, various authorities there including the uh i think the water control board and others and um, also notified the nuclear regulatory commission um, we 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 would need to go back and look to see what how the county assesses the leak itself to determine whether they would make a decision to close beaches my my initial answer pending review would be that based on the fact that the sewage was partly partially treated, it was uh, 7,000 gallons may sound like a big number, but that 
with respect to the size of the conduit and the size of the Pacific Ocean and how far out it is, my guess is that's not going to have an impact and perhaps the county considered that or the, the water control folks considered that. We'll have to check on that. But what I want to go back and, and point out something. We, uh, 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 in July of last year, I sent out an op, uh, you know, an op-ed to the community saying we would be very open, very transparent when when things when anything happened. This is a thing that happened, um, and so it's fresh off the press for us. We're dealing with it. We've isolated effluent discharges from the sewage treatment plant, who are absolutely sure that it's uh, properly functional. And there was a question raised about toilets. We do have temporary facilities on the station, but we are able to actually use our restrooms for washing hands, which is actually something we require of our employees during the COVID response. Uh, but perhaps, Ron, you could amplify a little bit on the notifications to the county and what what we think should happen, although this is really, um, it just has just happened. Yeah, Doug. Um, okay, so we notified San Diego Department of uh, Environmental Health and my understanding is, is they have the responsibility to assess the uh, what happened and uh, make uh, appropriate notifications to other agencies, as, you know, to take certain actions like to state parks, to close a beach, and so on. Um, so that would be their responsibility. Now, we, as far as who did we notify, we did notify the Water Board. We notified uh, the De Department of Health, as I mentioned. We notified state parks. We notified uh, California um, off of emergency services and as you mentioned we notified the nuclear regulatory commission so we made all the the appropriate notices um you know, i guess the open question is that was coming from mandy and others is perhaps we should have posted something on our website i think we should go back and assess that they, maybe, maybe we should. yeah oh, thank, thank you very much and uh, I hear some crosstalk. Uh, maybe that is Sarah Brady's line that's open. Uh, Sarah, do you want to ra raise your question right now if, uh, if your microphone is open? Your microphone is open. Uh, Sarah, can you hear us? Okay, we'll keep trying on that front. Uh, one last question on this issue of the sewage uh, uh, spill uh, or release. Um, the f Charles Langley raised the question about the 450 feet versus 6,000 feet. Is the 450 feet the number that's relevant for um, uh, for for this release, or is that number not relevant for any of these discharges? This is Ron uh, David. Uh, no, all, all the water flows through the Unit 2 conduit, and all, all the water flows out through the uh, through the diffusers, which are six, the first diffuser, 6,300 feet offshore. I don't know where the, the 450 feet uh, came from. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go back to, to the questions that Jerry posed to to, um, to Doug, the second of them about the the question of suspending work altogether during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. So as I indicated earlier, we we uh, we have a fully developed pandemic protocol response at San Onofre, and that response um, protects our workers. It also protects our critical groups that that provide critical functions to the station, uh, operators, security officers, and others. Uh, when the governor's order was first posted, we did stand down um, the fuel transfer. We also stood down, in a safe way, other deconstruction activities that were going on as we wanted to more fully understand the order. And then, um, you know, we worked very hard to understand the order, um, including the additional information the governor provided over the weekend concerning essential workers and uh, further to understand the Department of Homeland Security guidance. I want to point out again, once again, that the, the 18 nucle uh, decommissioned nuclear plants in the country, along with the 99 operational reactors, are part of the critical infrastructure sector under nuclear, one of the 16 sectors. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. And, and fundamental to that has to do with if, if waste is being removed from a station, uh, waste like nuclear fuel being removed from the pools and safely put into dry storage, um, 
the intent is that those activities should be able to continue. The challenge that we have and have, uh, continue to have, is to make sure it's done safely. And um, we strongly feel that the Song's uh, pandemic uh, protocol that we have in place, which protects workers and ensures things uh, that have to do with social distancing, travel restrictions for those workers, worker screening are entirely appropriate for the situation that we're in. Okay, thank you very much. And then the last question that came from Jerry, uh, from several members of the public but via Jerry, is um, uh, it concerns the aging management plan and the notifications uh, due to the Coastal Commission as part of the um, certificate or the original certificate. Uh, can you talk about that, Doug? I sure will. Uh, thanks. So it, we seem to be interchanging aging management plan with an inspection and, man, inspection and maintenance plan, and I realize probably too many acronyms. Uh, but um, as part of the 2015 coastal development permit for the Holtec system, um, SCE committed to developing an inspection and maintenance plan for that Holtec system. Special Condition 19 uh, of the during the coastal process involved us accelerating the inspection and maintenance plan for the whole tech system to be submitted uh, to the Coastal Commission by the 31st of this month, and we will be submitting it on the 31st of March. Um, the Coastal Commission is using a third-party engineering firm to review the the plan, and um, I'm sure. Um, that will be shared at a future Coastal Commission meeting. So that's the inspection and maintenance plan. When we talk about AMP or the Aging Management Plan, that's an NRC requirement for extending uh, the license period of dry fuel storage installations all across the country. So we are working on an aging management plan for the Arriva TN system, the horizontal system uh, at Songs, and uh, that aging management plan will be submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, to extend um, the Arriva TN dry fuel storage system. So two different things, inspection and maintenance plan and aging management plan. There are some similarities, but the inspection and maintenance plan was a specific commitment uh, to the Coastal Commission. Okay, thank you very much for that. I want to go back to Dan Stetson now, I think, as the next tranche of questions. Uh, actually, before I before I do that, um, let me let's try one more time uh, with Sarah Brady. Um, let's see if we can open her microphone, uh, Sanjay, and we'll we'll try it again right now. So, uh, Sarah Brady, your your microphone's not yet open. Um, bear with us for a second, Sanjay. Can you open that? Oh, there it is. Uh, so, actually, I see, I see the issue. We actually have two Sarah Brady's on the line here, um, which seems improbable. Uh, but Sarah, can you hear us now? Uh, why don't we try opening both those microphones, and then we'll close the first one uh, uh, if the second one works, Sanjay. Hello, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, you heard me. OK, this is not Sarah. This is a, a community uh, participant. And I want to know if it's true that Songs has met every regulatory requirement required by the NRC, California, and the EPA, and that the need for off-site emergency plans is no longer needed because the risk of radiation exposure is no longer present. Okay, and can you tell us what your name is just for the public record? Yeah, my name is George Allen. I'm from San Clemente, California. Okay, thank you very much, uh, George. Um, and then let's just see whether we have um, any more. So, uh, Sarah, can you? Um, okay, look, Sarah's just messages said she doesn't have a question at the moment. So, let's go back to Dan Stetson, who's going to put more questions to the SC team. Dan, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you, David. Um, um, I don't know that. Maybe I missed it, uh, but Mandy from Surfrider also wanted to know, with reference to the spill, uh, what actually happened that caused the spill, and uh, what's been put in place to prevent that from happening again? You want me to take that, Doug? Or yeah, sure, Ron. Okay, so uh, the on 
late Tuesday night or early Wednesday morning, we had an unexpected uh, inflow, a large inflow into the sewage treatment plant. And uh, we don't know what the source of that was. Maybe a line was plugged somewhere and then it released and all flowed at once into the plant. Um, and anyway, when it, when it had experienced this large flow, it caused the plant to go into an upset condition. And um, th that, that's what led to this, uh, this release. It basically flooded the sewage treatment plant and it didn't overflow, but this, the, uh, it flooded a different basin inside the plant and then pumps kicked on and continued to pump the water out to the ocean until it restored the level. So, so that's, that's what led to the event. Now we're investigating where did this, this large slug of water come from uh, once we figure that out, um, we'll, we will uh, restore the plant and, and uh, make sure it's operating properly and place it back in service. I would like to comment about one thing here. There was a comment made about placing this issue on the Songs Community, dot, or the Songs Community website. We fully intend to do that once we understand um, what happened um, and how to prevent it in the future. I just want everybody to make sure that, 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 we, that we understand also that the sewage treatment plant is out of service. There is no more effluent from it until we figure this out. Um, we, we wanted to bring this up here tonight so everybody knew about it. We're, we want to be open about it. Um, and once again, we're, we're really on the beginning stages of it. I think perhaps Mandy, uh, Mandy's comment had to do with as soon as it happened, put it on the website. I think that's something that we should consider. Um, uh, however, we, we also want to make sure we understand the situation first. We did make all the required notifications. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to also mention that for those of you who are following the instant message uh, thread, we'll see that Mandy posted a link to the Surfrider um, overview of this. Let's make sure that once you post something on the site, uh, Doug, that we also, as part of the regular circular materials to the CEP, we include that as well to the CEP members. Um, yeah, we'll see so, that. Uh, uh, Dan, are there any other questions related to the sewage uh, uh, issue before I go to Jerry for the next uh, tranche of questions? No, I think that pretty much covers uh, all the questions we had with reference to the uh, sewage spill and uh, the request for expanded notifications, uh, I think have all been covered. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so back to Jerry. Okay, Donna brought up a question about the monitors where do they have glass in front of them? I, I don't understand what you were trying to get, but something about glass in front of the radiation monitors. Uh, Jerry, if you're on, uh, unfortunately we're different locations, but I believe Jerry, if you're on, if you could, if you could take this answer. I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, um, Jerry Stevenson, if you're on, could you? Jerry Stevenson, so Sanjay, if you can unmute uh, Jerry Stevenson. Okay, yes, uh, so if you watched the, uh, the, the, saw any of the, the news articles, they showed videos of the radiation monitors and they do have a glass cover on them, they're waterproof. And that glass cover uh, is taken into account in, in the uh, calculations and the display of the, the radiation level. So the radiation level that, that they measure is accurate. It is not shielded by the glass. The only thing that would be shielded by the glass would be beta radiation, which is not a concern. Okay. And I'll have a follow-up question on an email we got from Paul Blanche, and it said, should the cancer leak and release cesium-137, will the new radiation monitoring system be able to detect all airborne levels exceeding the airborne concentrations equal to or above 10 CFR Part 20 limits? That was an email that we received. Uh, right. So, um, Jerry, I'll take an initial initial stab at that one and then hand it over to uh, Jerry Stevenson or um, Randall Granas, who I, is also, I think, on the on the line from songs. Uh, first of all, cesium, so in the, in the very unlikely event of a leak from a canister, and we've talked about the robustness of the canister system before um, at, at many meetings, it, it's, it's probably good to understand cesium. So cesium is, is, a, is a liquid. And, any cesium that we do have is also inside um, our fuel 
pellets, which are contained in fuel rods as part of a, an assembly inside the canister, so the, the fuel system itself is robust. But at the temperature these canisters are at, cesium is a liquid. So if you would, if in the postulated event where you would have cesium leak out, it's a liquid and it would, it would simply um, uh, a go rest in the bottom of the uh, cavity enclosure. It's very unlikely that um, the cesium would vaporize because it doesn't vaporize till around 1,200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is uh, which is three or four times as hot as a canister. So we're talking about a postulated event that's that's a little bit out of bounds. Um, I I believe in, in the, at the next CEP meeting when we do talk about um, um, some of these postulated events, we'll, we'll we'll be able to explain in more detail, especially with the radiation 101 session that we're going to hold. Um, and and be more educational around that. Um, the detectors on the dry fuel storage pad detect gamma radiation. Uh, uh, Jerry mentioned uh, the glass and how it would shield beta radiation. Beta radiation is not a concern here. Um, it's really only gamma radiation. So um, I, I, I do not think the cesium would make it out of the vault to be in a detectable form. But I'll let uh, uh, Jerry and maybe Randall take take over the uh, remainder, remainder of the details on the question. Can we unmute uh, Randall Granas, uh, please? Randall there, Jerry? So Sanjay, we need to uh, unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted now. So, okay. so Doug, uh, Doug covered it pretty thoroughly. The radiation monitors are extremely sensitive. They would detect the gamma radiation from the cesium sh should there should there be a, for a way to get it out of the canister, but there, which there isn't. Uh, but uh, a, if a if a plume of uh, cesium gas should move toward the uh, detector, it would certainly detect it. I wanted to say that in the planning for the next meeting, the outlier events meeting and response strategies, that a fair bit of attention has gone into different scenarios by which fuel or and uh, radioactive compounds could either vaporize or be atomized. And there's going to be a lot of discussion about the, that, uh, that question. It may well be that if there are continued questions from the public about this issue that's come up today, that we need to make sure we um, uh, beef up that discussion. Doug, is there anything else further we want to say about that before we go, I think, back to Dan for the next tranche of questions? I, I think we've covered it. Um, uh, we'll, we'll definitely continue to look at it, and I think, as you say, it, it will tie into what we do at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan? Stetson? Sure. Thank you, David. So Charles Langley had a few questions. One of them was answered with reference to the discharges, but he had a couple of other questions. Uh, question number one is, can you explain why the videos of the camera inspections of the damaged canisters are being kept secret, number one? And uh, number two, will Southern California Edison release those videos to the public? If not, why not? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer this one. Um, uh, first, we, we did post to our website photos and descriptions from the videos, and we, we've encouraged people all along to take a look at those. We also shared in prior meetings um, and described some of the um, scratch depth we had from incidental canister contact during the loading sequence. And, um, you know, we, we talked about the maximum scratch depth that, that we encountered through all of those canister inspections. We, we inspected eight canisters in total and had a, a, a good sample size there. We supplied all that data to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The maximum scratch depth was that we found was 26 mils or 0 0.026 inches. Um, we, we doubled that depth uh, to be conservative, assuming the canister would be withdrawn at the same contact point. And the, uh, the maximum depth we came up with was well under uh, design limits uh, uh, under the ASME code for the canister system. Um, Jerry Stevenson, if you'd like to provide any more details on it, that would be fine. But I also want to point out that, um, you know, the 
the actual videos, the full-length videos, are vendor proprietary information. And that information was supplied to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, for inspection purposes. So it would be, it would be a, a, a very difficult to release that proprietary information without jumping through a lot of hurdles um, uh, with the vendor. As such, it's proprietary. Jerry? This is Jerry Stevenson. Uh, Sanjay. Thanks, Doug. But I, I don't have anything to add. You covered it very thoroughly. Okay, I appreciate that. I think it's worth underscoring, David, again. Um, I think it's worth us both underscoring and making public again as part of the library that's being developed for the next meeting where you are with the scratch analysis and the independent assessment of scratch analysis and the NRC's own independent of scratch analysis because I think what the public, what I hear from Charles Langley and lots of other people and completely reasonable uh, questions uh, are where where are we with knowing what the actual damage might have been to the canisters and the integrity of that knowledge and the layers of independent oversight that have been applied to getting that information and then ultimately what does that mean for the canisters of the long haul? So let's make sure that that's part of the um, uh, part of the, the library and the public record for this for this next meeting. So thank you. Uh, David, David, this is Martha McNicholas. Martha, go ahead. The floor is yours. I have a question on the, the the comment about being proprietary information. That is proprietary to the vendor, not to Edison. Is that true? Do you have a clarification on that? Yes, uh, Doug. Yeah, sure. I'll answer that. Um, yeah, as uh, as Edison, the customer, we need to honor proprietary um, information. Uh, that a vendor requires to be maintained in a, in a proprietary fashion. We, we would not be able to release that information without the vendor's permission. Okay, but you do have the analysis is, uh, okay, the vendor provided the video or the photographic evidence and then Edison and, and analyzed that and sent that information to the NRC. So you have the information from it, you just don't have the original uh, material which is proprietary to the vendor. Is that correct? I'm, I'm going to try to answer that the best way I can. Yes, we did do a detailed analysis um, using the the vendor, uh, uh, the, the three the three dimensional camera inspections. We had that analysis um, reviewed by an independent third party, and we supplied that analysis to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That included the results of the inspections, uh, the analysis around incidental contact or canister scratch depth, and the bounding analysis around sample size. And um, I, that's been discussed before, but I, as, as um, you know, as David indicated, it's it's probably time to bring that forward again, and, and we'll also look at the content on the website to make sure it's adequately covered. Okay. I guess I wanted to make sure that the, the analysis is definitely public. It, it, the analysis is not the proprietary information. It was the uh, original evidence that was proprietary. So thank you. Yes, and that's that's correct, Doug, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Thank so you. My thank you very much, Martha. My understanding is that SCE went out and bought equipment. In this case, the equipment is a whole system for storing spent fuel from a vendor that's in a competitive marketplace, and they are worried about their intellectual property getting out, and yet at the same time, they have obligations to the public, um, to SCE, to, our, to the public's, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, to assure that their system performs as, as warranted. And so that's what the analysis is about. And it's a really important point that you've made, which is that the analysis is public. But let's. Let's bring that forward again because I, I recall a year or so ago, we went less than a year ago, we went through this to make sure that not only their analysis but also an independent analysis of their analysis was public. We got to make sure that all that is is a public again because the public is understandably asking questions about it. So thank you very much. I want to go back to Jerry Kern and see if there are other questions on his list. Uh, there, there's 
two pieces that are still kind of hanging out there. One is George Allen, you know, basically his, his songs in full compliance with state, local, and federal regulations, including the NRC. And that was just a, and then the other question is, and I think we've discussed this before, is the change in emergency response level one, because we have changed from an active plant to a plant that is basically storage. So I, I get that was I guess that was his question about the change in response level, emergency response. I believe that is so. This is Doug. I'll take that on. Um, uh, to, to, um, first of all, when the when the units were operating at power, um, our emergency response plan was was large and, and just to, just as a refresher the emergency response planning involves um, four levels uh, uh, an un, a notice of unusual event um, well normal operating then a notice of unusual event and then an alert condition and then uh, the highest level which would be um, I'm sorry a site emergency and the highest level which would be a general emergency so four levels unusual event alert site emergency and general emergency um, as part of the permanently shut down, shutting down the plant and meeting all NRC requirements for the emergency plan, it was appropriately reduced um, given that it would not be possible in the current figuration to reach by any postulated event a site emergency or general emergency condition. There is a postulated event involving um, a potentially a fuel handling incident in the spent fuel pool that would involve an alert declaration. And so our plan now is is um, appropriately reduced for that postulated event and a couple of other events that would around uh, that would be um, due to security conditions at the station. Uh, so the, the sample size or the size of p potential events we could have is actually quite reduced. We're meeting all requirements um, uh, of the NRC in implementing the plan that we have. Uh, once we complete safely complete the transfer of fuel to dry fuel storage, um, there will be no uh, event uh, based on a fuel handling incident by itself or anything to do directly with the fuel that could uh, push us into an alert condition. So we'll then appropriately address the emergency plan again. Um, the NRC um, has approved amendments to our emergency plan that will be implemented once the fuel is in dry fuel storage. I hope that answers it. I'm, I'm trying to be as accurate as I can with how the plan works. Okay, thanks. And then just a real quick follow up on Ms. Walker, that Holtec was on notice for violation and she wondered if Edison would speak to that. Well, I mean, what we can speak to is our knowledge of the notice of violation. Um, um, Holtec did receive a notice of violation. I don't believe they contested it. It had to do with their design controls and how they made changes to the safety analysis report. Um, and uh, and part of that had to do with the canister scratch issue in, the, in that their safety analysis report initially did not recognize the potential for canister incidental contact or canister scratches during the loading sequence. And we've discussed some of that before. Um, and in fact, um, Edison, San Onofre, we performed our own independent scratch analysis using qualified sampling techniques to verify with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that our fuel canisters are safe and uh, fully meet their design requirements for storage. But that, as I understand it, is the nature of the violation that Holtec received. I don't believe they contested it. And, um, and it will be Holtec's action to work through any follow-up uh, actions from that violation with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Okay, thank you. And that's else, all I have, have, David. Okay, I want to just say before I turn it back to Dan to see if you guys others, that I spoke um, uh, last week uh, with some members of the Holtec team. I called up to see how they're doing with the COVID response and also underscored that it is vitally important that they continue at high levels of excellence the fuel transfer operations. And I know all of us believe that, 
I think it's important for us to continue to emphasize that, and I know they've got that message very clearly from the events of the last uh, of the last few years. Dan, the, the floor is the floor is yours. Um, thank you. I think let's go through uh, all the questions that have been submitted, but but I've got one, Doug. Maybe you can help us understand. I I, I know we're all, including SE, is deeply concerned about the COVID nineteen situation. Should a number of your team members um, become infected, how deep is your bench in terms of being able to continuing the offloading situation and putting them into the ISFA seat? Okay, thanks for that. So first, let me mention the, uh, the, the uh, pandemic protocol um, that we do have in place, which is actually a procedure for the station. It's a directive. Um, uh, that directive provides layers of defense for our critical work groups such as security officers, operators, um, and key uh, support personnel for those groups, such as radiation protection technicians, a few maintenance technicians, and others. So if you think about the pandemic protocol, you think about it in terms of rings or layers of defense. There, uh, so regarding the fuel transfer work, I mentioned earlier that um, we exercised the protocol with respect to Holtec's conduct of the work. We took a pause on the work. We briefed all the Holtec workers. We came up with ways to increase social distancing during the work and do that safely. We, uh, Holtec agreed to travel restrictions and worker screening and other measures to ensure safe conduct of the fuel transfer. Now, if you mentioned if we would encounter a situation where we find that a worker or a coworker uh, has tested positive for the virus. That requires us to take a halt on the plan and to actually implement a protocol uh, in the directive to investigate who that worker communicated with in the work environment, um, uh, whether social distancing was maintained, the areas the worker traveled in, and then to make an appropriate decision on um, areas to be uh, quarantined off, um, worker quarantine, uh, potentially even looking at household members for the worker involved in the positive test. So based on all of that, um, we would make a decision on what work to curtail, and, and, and that would be an appropriate decision um, made based on maintaining those layers of defense that I mentioned earlier, because in the end, um, the goal is to keep our absolutely critical workers, our operators and our security officers healthy and safe uh, so that we can protect the fuel and perform our security functions. I also want to say that we have looked at methods to improve our defense in depth. We have defense in depth in the operator ranks and we have methods to improve defense in depth in security and we're taking a number of actions uh, with our security officers to uh, continue to maintain that and ensure that um, you know, we do not have um, a, a situation where the uh, virus would be passed from one individual to the other. Thank you. Can you just say a couple words, Doug, about testing is in short supply, um, but ramping quickly, um, maybe not quite as quickly as the president says, but um, that's not the first time that's happened. Um, could you comment on when and how the workforce is being tested or would have access to testing and whether that would be done on some preferential basis or what can we know? Uh, so we don't, we don't have um, access to preferential testing at San Onofre. What we do have is a screening process. So when workers show up at the station, um, they're asked um, questions about their health, about their travel, about travel um, of household members and so on. And if a worker um, uh, screens out, then they're asked to uh, not enter the site and contact their supervisor. And we work through an attachment in our protocol to determine uh, what the risk is for that worker. We do ask that worker to seek help from their medical professional if they think they have symptoms involving uh, potentially um, contracting the COVID-19 virus. Um, but once again, we don't have direct access to testing at the site. Um, uh, it would be great if we did. Uh, we, we do require uh, medical professionals to, to, to handle that, and then the worker would communicate back to us um, on the results potentially, 
Um, there's obviously uh, confidentiality around that as well on, on the workers level, but um, there would be a 14 day quarantine depending on uh, the screening process that I just outlined. Okay. Uh, Dan, any other questions from you? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. So I want to go to the to some closing comments, including a little bit of a summary of some of the key points. David, can I say one thing before we you close? I'd really like to thank Lorraine and Manuel and Sanjay for pulling this together. I know it's, they did above and beyond the work to get this thing off the, the deck. And I really want to at least express our appreciation for all the work they did to pull this off. Absolutely. And I, I know everyone seconds that um, this is, this is normally these meetings are complex and difficult. This um, has raised the level of difficulty, removed the net and um, everyone's done an extraordinary job. So I want to thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for that point, Jerry. Hey, this is Paul Blanche. Can I make a quick comment on the COVID? Uh, okay. Go, Paul, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the East coast and, uh, at Indian Point this afternoon, um, two people confirmed with COVID. Uh, they're, they tested 16. There's two operating plants at the Indian Point site, and I'm not sure what their protocol is. I'm not even sure this is public information, but it is confirmed. Um, I don't know whether it's security people, operating people, but it does get into the plants. It got into Indian Point. Where they're not in any danger right now. I mean, they have 97 operators, and they only need 16 at the time. Uh, but it could possibly spread, so people got to be very vigilant. Um, the comment on the season 137, uh, the limit. I, I heard someone say we could detect the airborne limits. Well, the airborne limits are uh, 10 to, two times 10 to the minus. 10th microcuries per milliliter. Uh, those area radiation monitors cannot detect that level of cesium or, in fact, the level of any other isotope that might be released. So the information wasn't quite accurate. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to, before we have any uh, closing comments, and I want to make a few points of summary. I want to ask any other CEP members if they have anything further they want to ask or say before we go to the last segment of today's meeting. Uh, David, uh, Roger had a couple quick questions he put on the uh, on the uh, thing. Maybe we could ans answer those questions real quickly. Okay. Great, one go ahead. Is, one is, can uh, we be assured that none of the waste will end up in mm -hmm. any landfill in California? And number two, uh, I asked about the interior of the domes, highly contaminated, that was not answered. How they, will they deal with a highly contaminated rubble versus regular rubble? Okay, sure, Dan, I'll, 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 I'll take those. I appreciate it. Um, so first of all, the, the simple answer to the question about no waste ever ending up at a California landfill or dump is, it says, can you assure? And I, I would say, yes, we can assure that. There are no plans to ship any waste uh, to an ultimate destination in California. There's actually a governor's order that prohibits that. Um, and so the waste will go mainly to, um, uh, uh, to Clive, Utah, as Ron discussed on rail. There is some waste that will go to La Paz, Arizona, which is generally what we call clean waste. And then some additional provisions for waste to go to, to a WCS in, uh, in Texas, I believe, but no waste, uh, will occupy landfills or dumps in California uh, from songs. Um, I'm reading the question now about the interior of the domes. Uh, I think that is referring to the reactor vessel internals and those being highly contaminated. It is true that they're highly contaminated. That is the uh, most complex work in the decommissioning a sequence that I discussed earlier. It's about an 18 to months to two year window to properly um, decontaminate components, uh, cut up those reactor vessel internals, which is done underwater for shielding, and then store the what we call greater than class C waste in appropriate canisters. And uh, that greater than class C waste will actually be stored at San Onofre in our horizontal storage modules, the Ariva TN system, until there's a repository just like uh, for the fuel. 
And so we can talk about that at a future meeting. Uh, we can. We actually planned at one point to show uh, videos of the cut-up sequence for this meeting, but it was too hard to get that uh, into an online forum like this. But we will be. We will be um, uh, showing those details as well as uh, discussing um, the greater than Class C waste picture and where the uh, where those um, containers will will be stored on site. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and Dan, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you, David. I just, want to, I just want to make sure there's been a lot of concern and I understand an understandable anxiety about the COVID-19 response. What you're doing, Doug, is in complete compliance with the governor's uh, orders and the relevant county orders on work stoppage and non-stoppage? Uh, yes, it is. We're in compliance with the governor's order and the governor's order amended to include construction as well. Um, uh, there are no specific San Diego County orders that I'm aware of, um, which would be more restrictive than the governor's order. Um, uh, there was an order in Orange County that I would point out the plants in San Diego County. Um, I believe a, at least part of the Orange County order was uh, amended or retracted. Um, we did review that as well, um, uh, just for reference purposes. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I know a lot of us are puzzled just looking at the number of construction projects still underway, and that, of course, is part of the balancing act, for better or for worse, um, uh, that that folks are, are going through right now. So I want to, um, any other comments from the CEP members uh, before we break? Okay. So I want to say um, what I'm going to try and do at the end of each meeting is offer a few bullet points of, of summary and then uh, with staff we'll work on um, uh, getting those in the right format along with supporting material on that out to the CEP and then out to all of the communities uh, in particular through elected officials uh, shortly after these meetings leading so we'll have the video and so on and the big slide decks that have a few key points. Um, so. Uh, uh, First is that the next meeting of this panel is going to be about the outlier events and responses. That's going to be a very, very important meeting, one that's taken a long time to put together, and I think something that a lot of people in the community have been keen to see more focus on. Uh, second is there's a number of um, uh, now online resources for mo long-term monitoring of the site. That includes the radiation monitoring system uh, and the interface with the California state officials on that and the interactive ocean quality monitoring system, both of which we learned more about tonight. They're on songscommunity.com and they're on the re relevant public uh, agency websites. Um, third is the uh, dismantlement of the plant is now underway and we have an invitation out. We should at some point in the future, uh, near future, have the energy solutions folks in to talk about what's happening there. Um, and that's going to affect traffic flows, including the rail spur upgrades. So that's going to happen sooner rather than later. And I think we should look for, and we should continue to push out to the community through the website and people have signed up information about impacts on traffic flow, including around, uh, around the, the, the beaches. And then related to that is the fuel transfer operations continue. And I understand, and I've seen on the chat, there's a range of views as to whether that's an essential service or not an essential service. Um, I, I think, um, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about the worker safety issues and how to assure worker safety. I think there's also a lot in literature about the safety of fuel if it's in canisters, and uh, that's uh, crucially, uh, crucially important. But the point right now, as of today, um, is the fuel transfer operation is moving about a canister a week, and they're at 55 out of 73 canisters, and so that puts them sometime mid-summer to complete that. But I think a lot of questions and ongoing questions about conditions of the workforce and, and how to understand that. Uh, fourth of the five things I wanted to mention, we've had a number of very important questions from the public um, uh, around worker safety and around when and how does do uh, work, do operations at the plant suspend. We've got important questions about the sewage release in the last 24 hours um, and, and response is still forthcoming um, on that. And the last thing I'll mention is that uh, fifth out of five is that we've had an, an, another round of very important questions about are we ready mm -hmm. to move the fuel when the fuel is in the SFC and potentially we have places to, to send it. And so at a meeting sooner rather than later, we need to have a discussion about interim storage, maybe long-term storage as well, but that's more magical, and what the strategy would be around getting ready for interim storage. So those are five takeaways I take from this meeting. 
we'll add and subtract, I'll coordinate with the with staff and with the CEP leadership, get something out quickly to the CEP members and on the site by way of a kind of little summary. That was one of the outcomes of the CEP closed door session back in January, back in the old days when we could meet together in person. Um, hopefully those old days were back soon. Um, and uh, I really appreciate that, that input. Um, Doug, I want to give the floor to you uh, for any uh, closing comments you have, and then I'll, I'll sign off the meeting after that uh, with a pointer to where we're headed with uh, future meetings. Doug? Thank you, David. I'd like to point out that, uh, or at least appreciate uh, some of the very pointed questions we had tonight. I think actually the mechanism of posting them up online seems to be actually quite useful. And so this enables us to take some additional content and look forward to the next meeting and the meeting after. And I really appreciate some of the questions we had around actually, you know, what's going to happen with respect to, um, you know, dust mitigation plans and things that go on during the D&D work, the, the, um, the work inside the containment domes. So we will take that and, and continue to provide those details with pictures. And, and I, I got to say that we're going to, remain very open with things that occur. We're going to um, share them at the CEP meeting. Uh, if, if uh, in, in all cases, the, that, that includes continued lessons learned and improvements in the fuel handling and safe storage of the fuel. Um, we're going to share uh, on our website and at the future, at the next meeting and maybe the meeting after, if this continues, our response to the, uh, the, the COVID-19 situation. And, and I will tell you, Edison broadly is taking a very, um, a, a very rigorous approach to the response, ensuring proper services for our customers. So, I really appreciate the engagement tonight, and actually going back again the the actual detailed questions. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Let me just pause for a moment and see if any of the CEP members want to say anything before we sign off. I don't see any microphones coming off. You, have Marnie Magda, did you want the floor? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to you and Jerry and Dan for such a wonderful meeting for all of us to learn so much more. It's been just a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, Paul Wyatt, did you want to say something? Yeah, just a, a quick comment to, to wrap up as we're working on you know our plans and, and our emergency uh, response to um, and I brought this up when I was uh, reconfirming sort of the shortest timeline. The shortest timeline of everything went perfect out there in terms of being able to, to move this where we want to and finally dispose of that race into a, a storage location that, you know, the, the NRC or inter, uh, provides or interim is 10 years away, right? I mean, literally to, to get it. So when you plan, I think we have too much of a sight that maybe we're going to solve this problem quickly. And we, we have a lot of people concerned that it's 100 years. Um, and, and sometimes that gets discounted. But I think it's an important thing as we put together this plan of our response and, and how we plan for it and what to do to know that. The, the fuel's there for 10 years or more, uh, even if we don't hit a single stumbling block in the way. So as, as community, we just sim simply need to recognize that and work with that piece of data. So I think that was very useful. And thank you all. And it was a, I thought it was a very useful meeting, even if done under uh, abnormal circumstances. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your, for your comments and, and your insight. I don't see any other microphones open. I just want to ask Jerry if there's any further comments he has. No, I, I, I just, again, to thank Lorraine and